With that we card, are heading though, into a best of five decider here, KP, unlike, uh, you know, what the overlay says, that is going to be a best of five, as you see, two home maps picked by each of these players, Kiljardi versus Cat. No major surprise, I would say, in this part of the bracket, two players that you kind of expect to get there in the end. In fact, I would not be shocked if both of these players made it in by the end of this weekend, but one of these two players will punch their ticket into the main event today. The other one is going to have to retry tomorrow. We're going to kick off this set on Gorge with a Delhi versus Japanese matchup, but KP, there is something that's even more so intriguing for me. That's the fact that Kiljardi has picked one of our brand new maps, Bridges, as his home map. I'm excited for it. Uh, we'll talk about it if we get to it. It has some very interesting creative choices. Uh, actually, you know, two-fifths of the maps in rotation are creations of Avli. I think that says everything. Maybe, I don't know, I'm just going to, like, spitball out there. Relic, maybe hire this man. He clearly has some good ideas. That's all I'm going to say. But I believe the series is ready to get underway. So let's not waste any time. We can dissect it when we get in. We've got potentially five games ahead of us, and I know people want to be spoiled with additional Age of Empires a day. We kick off this best of five, decide a series between Kiljardi and Cat, and we do so on Gorge. Japanese, not a civilization that you very commonly see on this map. So Cat definitely looking to make things interesting in here. Kiljardi, a much more conventional civilization here for Gorge. Of course, Sacred Sites spawning fairly close to each other, fairly well um, defendable, I would say. Uh, we, you kind of touched on this in the previous set because we can build a wall in the middle and just kind of section off the map such that you have a good control over the Sacred Sites. Mm -hmm. I'm actually curious how the Japanese player is going to approach this, though, because uh, the problem with the Japanese, I feel, is that they are a little slow to come online. They really start coming up, or like, really, they get their punching power once they get to late feudal, early castle. Yeah. And by the time you get there, the Delhi is going to leverage all that map control. Do you want to tell me um, what you do? Do you want me to tell you rather what Japanese do in this matchup? They win. They have a 68% win rate against Delhi. <laughs> Delhi players right now are scrambling to find a solution for this. Japanese are looking actually it's it's a newly discovered thing right like obviously going to this deli is like oh who can stop the deli you know like today when it's like there's a few serves that eyebrows eyebrows has them on lock this is one of them japanese builds are quite frustrating even the fast castle build comes in too quick that you're able to contest the deli and if it turns into a full feudal warfare we've been seeing some very creative builds involving mass under Begisha and mass horsemen with the daimyo buff that actually slaps the deli out of the game so Kiljali's fully aware of this. Kiljali's actually one of the players that has been experimenting quite a bit, actually. Um, he's even been doing some attempts at fast castle-type builds with Dome of Faith. So don't be shocked or surprised if you don't see a tower victory this game. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point you bring up, indeed, because we always uh, kind of touch on this fact that, you know, win rates are great, but apparently, well, obviously sample size is somewhat limited, especially when you look at high-level games. And you always have to consider what maps those uh, games have been played on. But indeed, there are ways that the Japanese can win this. I just feel like the problem that they face here, early on at least, is that the Delhi is the one civilization that comes online a little quicker. Kura Storehouse, love that um, landmark. It's got to be a nice and safe position, tucked away at the back as well. And of course, with the Kura Storehouse, you do get something that's fairly unique uh, amongst most civilizations for this map free farming on a map that doesn't have a lot of safe food to work with. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, because of where you plop it, you also get a free lumber camp. So it saves you 50 wood in the early game. Sounds like a nitpicky detail, but actually makes quite a big difference. Also saves you the extra idle time of building it up. And also the location is set in means that all the farms that are spawned here will be protected. Long term in this game, he's going to miss out on a few farms, right? Um, but ultimately, they are all going to be safe, and that's going to be very frustrating for Kiljardi because you know you need to kind of chip away. Another thing that's quite awkward is that if you look, Cat got a decent spawn for gold gathering. It's retracted behind a tree line. You could basically just wall this in, which would shut down any Ghazi raid plays early on, especially considering that that's the way the Delhi always open up, right? They might try to follow up archers, but the delay could be a little bit too much in this game. Yeah, I feel like one of the big things here with that Kura storehouse is, as you said, you miss out on a couple of farms with how it's positioned right next to the TC. But if the game goes long, it doesn't matter. And more importantly, this matchup is probably not going to be decided uh, 30 minute plus onwards. 
this is going to be a matchup where either of these players will likely secure a win by minute 25. Yeah, and the interesting thing is it could be even sooner because obviously the way the oh, Delhi yeah. play, but also the way Cat plays. I've watched a few of his games. Surprisingly aggressive player. Like Cat has found a new new kind of path. It's interesting as well, actually, because his story of the expansion became quite grim, Lydical. Um, Cat kicked off his ranked experience this season by losing all 10 games and ranking gold. He climbed his way all the way out of the gutter, eventually to get back up to the tippity top where he belongs, because what I've been seeing in the last few competitive series and a few different tournaments from him, it's been really impressive. Yeah, he is a member of the 3D clan, which is, I guess, one of the more prominent clans when you look at competitive AoE4. Of course, um, the star player of the team B, but also Garneth we've seen a lot, Cat is there as well. So a lot of talented players in this top 20 that will be um, very much competitive in this tournament. Yeah, and I feel like he's been the one that's maybe, I don't know, maybe it's like the inactivity or whatever, but kind of felt like he'd done himself a disservice and people done him a disservice and that everyone looks at B and everyone looks at Garnaf aka Mikos, but also a lot of people are now looking at Anatan. Feels like Kat usually is, you know, the, the cool guy behind the scenes doing a lot of cool things but not getting enough recognition. I think this is a prime opportunity to flex why he's so talented, considering he's up against one of the players that I have pegged as one of my breakout stars of 2024. Kiljardi has looked phenomenal. I mean, this guy... Similar to Kat's recent experience, long-term Kiljadi had kind of a memeful origin. This is a guy that was known to be a, a one-pump jump who went for a Dark Age Rax opening and always played the English, right? He has flourished as a player in the last year. I'm glad to see the Finns getting some representation because ever since Sarah went back to StarCraft, we've been feeling a little bit light there. Yeah, to be honest, Kiljadi is probably one of the biggest rising stars of the game right now. That has been the case for quite some tournaments now, so um, you're actually kind of waiting some bigger results from him but he has yeah. flashed some impressive talent every once in a while and in a league format like we're going to have for elite classic <laughs> 2 he could actually thrive and this is exactly what i expected Adam. do you want to know why he's got kill in the name because it's all he thinks about doing in the game an outpost Whoa. rush as the deli and also a hit onto the berry line the cat was slow to react to yeah, uh, I uh, almost feel like that tower placement was just a diversion. Good job by Cat to save all but one of the villagers, but as many of those villas have been beaten up, these Ghazi Raiders are starting to find some value for themselves. And Cat, uh, he, he's struggling. Yeah, that, not just because that pony died, the villager died as well. So what was meant to be a good trade there, actually wasn't. It was a one-for-one -one trade, and this is problematic. Right now you're seeing horsemen spammed against Ghazi. You're tempted to say, great for the Delhi, right? No. Nope. Uh, what happens here is a gradual daimyo, and then once Uma Bannerman come out, those horsemen are more efficient traders than the Delhi, especially when you also add in the fact that you can get double melee attack upgrades on the Japanese. Now, one thing you need to consider is that for you to get that Bannerman out, you need the TC upgrade, which requires stone. And I feel like stone collection stalled out here for Cat, which is kind of eliminating that option for him to start bringing in that Uma Bannerman. Yeah, so like for now, it's only going to be Horseman because he's got too much food. He can work on the gold. Um, the interesting thing is he's probably used some of the stone that he already gathered to get the Aristlets. That's a really nice play. That's why Japanese fast cast is so efficient. But remember, over time, he will eventually get those Daimyos courtesy of the fact that when you drop off gold, you get 20% of it as stone as well. I'm starting to feel like we're looking at a semi-fast castle here for Cat. He's yeah. floating a lot of gold. He is struggling for food, though, and this is a bit of a problem. He pretty much has the gold he needs for Castle Age, but he isn't really able to get more food, or I should say, he isn't able to get it quicker than he is doing right now. He has all the farms <laughs> occupied, and he has no other means of obtaining food. So he's kind of being bottlenecked right now in terms of uh, the resources for Castle Age by not having a lot more food available. Oh, that's a sick snipe though. Horseman, Ooh. find the Scholar. Wow. Okay, so this is actually a really big deal. Kiljardi doesn't want to have to go across on the gold. He has one more shot at taking a sacred site. And these horsemen could just catch him again. So what's annoying is Kiljardi wants to be shutting down the eco with these raiders. Now he's just going to have to mirror the horsemen. Yes, and when your opponent is fast castling, you don't want to be the one playing reactionary. It's kind of what he has to do though, right? Like, you know, he's adding his spim and he's setting up the walls. He couldn't even get them up quick enough. At least one sacred site is locked in. But the reality of this game right now is Cap is about to pull the trigger. He's already got the stables down. If he just spams Mount Samurai, 
as long as he's got enough food to work with, Kiljardi's in trouble because Ghazi Raiders don't handle Mount Samurai well. Spearmen don't, actually, funnily enough. The broken thing about Mount Samurai is the deflective armor offsets the initial hit from a Spearman. And then, all of a sudden, you're a mere feudal Spearman versus a Castle Age Knight. Yeah, the, the problem there is that, uh, obviously, once the Knight starts engaging the Spearman, the Spearman dies fairly quickly. So even just taking out the first hit from the Spearman, just makes it so much better for these uh, mounted samurai to fight this. Floating gate on the way for uh, oh, wow. Cat also means that he's going to have a Yorishiro to play around with to boost his production. Yeah. And on the other side, I'm I'm not a big fan of what I'm seeing. It's going no. to be a mix of units. Kiljardi spending resources on archers when the opponent has absolutely no infantry that he needs to take out. And look at the freebies as well. No textiles here. Kiljardi quick to react, but still loses the villager for it. Tech up now complete. Entire age behind. And look at this, we're getting a switch up. Cat, he had the stables. That's gonna be a Rax Yurashiro drop, so he's gonna be pumping into the samurai. Wait, is it Yurashiro? Did, did he drop a Yurashiro in a farmhouse? Or the forge? Uh, I didn't see it. We'll, we'll go Yurashiro north, it's, it's north, it's there, it must be north. Yeah, it must what? be the stable. No, there's no, you see a sign above it. There's like, wait, did, what? Did he walk out with the Shinto? Nani? Uh, Interesting. No, oh, no, oh, oh is he, he's still Wait, holding what? it. He's still Wait, holding oh, it. Oh, dude. It. <laughs> That's so griefing. He rallied it under the racks, but it was a misclick. Oh, man. That's actually a big deal because that's like, that, that might not seem like, a, like, you know, 15, 20 seconds. But keep in mind that triples the production speed of that rack. So big whiff there. Oh, that's a big one because that timing, time is of the essence here. His opponent has three sacred sites. So. Kyojari is now looking to get up to Castle Age. So missing out on all that production is actually taking out a lot of momentum from Cat. And he is making Foot Samurai, which is not going to be great against that many Ghazi Raiders. And he has a finite amount of time to capitalize on this Castle Age because now Kyojari is looking to age up himself. Kyojari, I mean, if he tries to rush an age up now, I actually think he kind of flatlines a little. The Samurai count is going to boost. The problem is the Kura Storehouse makes this feasible. Like, this is why Kura Storehouse is like S tier. It just allows this where otherwise you wouldn't be able to. Like, even this idea of diving into Ghazi here, if the Samurai were hanging around, it'd be a bad fight. Looks like the Mount Samurai is going to try to slow things down. I actually love that from Cat. The body blocks and that forces the re-rally, which buys time for the village to move away. Cat might even consider going for Fudasashi, the level 3 wheelbarrow, because at that stage, it means even these Ghazi will never be quick enough to pinch the villagers. And the significance of this wall is just now being showcased over here. This is buying very, very precious seconds here for Kiljardi. Eventually, the wall gets broken through and the sacred site is going to be decapped. But Kiljardi is buying himself a lot of time over here. Some horsemen looping around, trying to hit the eco. Villager count is neck and neck. You do have a decent amount of gold income from the sacred sites, though, for Kiljardi, but he's still stuck in Feudal Age. He's low on food. He needs some more food to get up to Castle. It's gonna be, it's going to be difficult to get when all his berry villagers are being harassed like that. Yeah, no textiles either, right? So another loss there. That's now four worker kills in total. Cat now with a free eco lead. It's gonna actually matter quite a lot, considering that Kiljardi is gonna have to get something quality out to deal with these samurai. His current existing army is not gonna be good enough. Skull is gonna be chased down. Samurai may be slow, but they are impenetrable right now. Look at this. One Mountain Samurai versus eight Ghazi. He's playing critical time. And funnily enough, he's not trading out terribly, right? As long as he just continues to hit, he should be taking one Ghazi with him. The TC is assisting. Yeah, th these are fights that Kiljardi doesn't want to take, but he kind of needs to. Exactly. He actually does a decent job taking out a lot of these valuable Samurai. So uh... destroy value is still neck and neck, but... Kiljardi has to sacrifice a lot of troops to do this. So he's once again suffering from setbacks when it comes to his cost -age timing. Yeah, but this was better than it should have been. Cat went in without Odachi, so he didn't have the plus four, and he basically was fighting infantry that entire time. Like, you need Odachi here because Kiljardi's entire strat revolves around using spears to tank, so his Ghazi live, right? Because his Ghazi attack better than spears. The way you counter that is by getting plus four damage against the tank, right? You just melt them quick enough. And that's extra damage gone, that's the tank removed, and then you hit the premium unit. But that felt like a bit of a, a slip up. Cat, he's finally queued it up. He's got melee tech level two coming in. Daimyo upgrade is now through, so we will be seeing Bannerman. This is the power spike of the Japanese. Huge DPS increases. Unfortunately, on the other side, Kiljardi already on his way up. And this is an interesting choice. House of Learning into Samurai. 
interesting idea here. I, I I think what matters the most here for Kiljari is that he can match the Castle Age at this point. So, now he's going to have the option to at least mix in a couple of crossbows, something that deals with the Samurai. But let's not forget, it takes a long, long time to get those Castle Age upgrades in for these daily troops. So there is still going to be a nice window here for Cat to exploit. Yeah, and he's got the level 2 ranged armor coming as well. So these archers are going to tickle. TC's going to tickle. Homeblaze just got queued up. But like, I'm still a little bit perplexed by this choice. It makes sense for Lancers, but you could never go men at arms, right? Like, you're still trading poorly against Japanese because they get plus 4 versus with Odachi, and then they get an extra melee tech. It's like a, a little bit of a wonky choice. We'll see if it pays off. And the other issue as well is you're not scaling your eco, right? Raids coming in. Villagers are going to shift away. However, wait, 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 what? Oh, no. The Seek Shelter. Bye. <laughs> All of the corner. Oh, That'll nice be a counter attack. Nice, That's Delhi a beautiful counter attack with a samurai, though. Cat for a moment had every single one of his villagers idle. By the way, I don't know Dude. what he did. Might have uh, misclicked them. But I think he's dead. Yeah, it's so chaotic. Both look, players look. suffering from a lot of idle time. But, but look at his numbers eco. are shrinking. Yeah, look at his eco. Like he can't get more army right now. I. Like, it looks stupid, like, oh my god, he's gonna lose all the Delhi units. Like, he wants to lose them. This is about as good as it gets for a trade. This is the, the poor man army, right? It's all the feudal units. He wants to get heavily armored units. So what is he doing? Sending them in, trying to kill Eco. But actually, on the flip side, Cat! Yeah! Oh my god! And Cat is killing Vils. Kiljari wasn't able to. He was idling them, but he wasn't killing them. And when you look at the Vil count overall, it is Kiljari who suffered worst. I can't believe that. I, 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 Crazy like, idle time on both sides, but when you look at the overall numbers, it's looking a lot better for Kill <laughs> or for um, for Cat actually. Wait, can we check? Can we textiles check? Right, because I'm, I'm a stickler for this. Cat has textiles, doesn't he? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> oh my god, dude! If you ever needed an example yep. of why textiles is worth it, the guy who has to pay for it got it. Look at the difference. I, I had that creeping suspicion as we were watching this unfold. The Kiljari just got picked off way too quickly. Whereas for Cad, he was facing feudalized units, as you kind of touched on that, spearmen, archers. And especially because they weren't focus firing, they damaged a lot of villas, but they really failed to kill many. Now, silver lining here for Kiljari is that he's coming in with the relics, so he's going to start offsetting that eco difference. But this is still a big punch in the gut at this point for him. Yeah, and it's crazy, right? Like, Kiljari was slow to pull those villagers away that are being massacred literally next to a TC. What makes it sadder is if he just made the logical choice, accepted he needed textiles in this game after the early horseman raids, probably would have lost maybe half that. I think it would have actually been less, right? Because the samurai don't get a duchy bonus against villages, only against infantry. Would have given you more time to react, but got to give so much credit to Cat. Distracting with that dive where he's idling himself out. Um, the weird little raid attempt on the wall on the south side, that's another alert ping for Kiljardi. Like the goal for Cat was literally just to go everywhere. Make sure that Kiljardi couldn't catch all the alert pings and punish him for it. What's it? So when the dust settles, Cat possesses a 10 eco lead, most of that coming from the eco kill differential. But you did have quite a few sacred sites for Kiljardi for a while. He actually managed to revolve most of the map. And now he's capping the sacred sites. He's got some relics as well. And he's the one with the highly mobile units, the Lancers, which can start picking away at the enemy eco. Yeah, meanwhile, Cat, although it's a fantastic hold, although he got some fantastic trades, worst possible time for this. Raids come in when he's trying to move out onto the berries and the boar. He didn't get the wolves up quick enough. This is a smart play by Kiljardi. And this was maybe one of my concerns around the samurai timing. When you open samurai like this, you have to go in and do something permanent. He did get some eco kills, but it's not like, for example, there was a second TC he slayed. Instead, now you have this situation where you've got a slow, clunky unit, and Kiljardi has Cav. So he has the ability to now go out with the pocket resources, and Cat's at a point in the game where for this comp to work, you need farms. There is more to this. All three of the sacred sites are on Kiljardi's side of the wall. So, as much as 10 minutes is a long time, even if it's not about the actual sacred site win condition, there's gonna be a lot of gold income from Kiljardi that's gonna be difficult for Cat to contest. The other issue I have is like farm check. I don't think he's added in a single farm so far, right? 
Okay, he's adding a few. So, yeah, but the, the reality, the, this kind of sad thing, this cursed storehouse with the way he plays the stables and the lack of wood chopping yeah. adequately, like basically he's added in the farms he would have got for free otherwise. Not a great economy. Yeah, definitely. Especially considering that Kiljardi isn't really playing aggressive now, so it's not like he really needs those farms to be close to the TC. In the very long run, you could actually argue that you could just delete the stable and get these farms back. But yeah, he didn't get much of a value from that uh, Kura storehouse. There was some value, but not as much as you would hope from it. I do like this Onan Bagisha punt though. It's kind of funny because when you spam them like this, they can even cut lances down. But it's more about running past the men at arms, catching the crossbow transition, and also still having an active raider. Funnily enough, he can actually kill these. Uh, he's got, what, level 3 melee tech, if I'm not mistaken? And in this count, dude, you'll shred through the paper. Okay, it's only level 2, but still. If he times this right, he'll pinch them before they can move away. Here we go. Looks for the void blocks and kill Charlie. <laughs> that was so close. That was, that was by design, folks. He pulled all of them together on one side and then just turned around. He's waiting for the crossbows to arrive. Crossbows that would just absolutely annihilate all of the samurai. And of course, Onabugisha are fragile, so knights can actually dispatch them fairly quickly. Yeah, it's critical that you get the charge. And one thing that's going to be really nice with this Lancer choice by Kiljardi is, remember, he went House of Learning. He's got the plus three damage. This is how you find value. Men at Arms doesn't make sense. I think, like, I feel like that one is cute as a mistake. Because if you build Men at Arms, Samurai just beat you there, right? You get plus three damage, they get plus four. But Lancers is just a pure plus three. And I can tell you from experience of watching, I want to say at this point, more Japanese games than anyone else. You don't build spears before Imperial Age. It's just unheard of. It doesn't feel right. Nagiyari makes it decent. Anything before, you always should look at Onabigisha and say, this feels better. That's a lot of infantry, though. kiljari has got quite a few knights, quite a few crossbows as well. But he needs to make sure that those crossbows never meet the Onabugisha. He needs that front line of the knights. He's got some scholars as well for combat healing, but it looks like we might, coming, we we might be approaching a decisive fight here. Lances. They need to cycle charge this, but it's awkward because Onabugisha is so fast. Phantom Anora is actually doing a lot of work to keep Kai in this. Kujardi with the start step back has to reset. Crossbows are going to start getting sacrificed though. And even with the home blades, I'm starting to doubt that Kujardi is going to be able to survive this long enough. Samurai are disappearing slow and steady though, and a lot of these troops are banked up for Cat. He does have double the army count though, so as you said, it might just be quantity over quality at this point. They're not all here though, is the issue, right? I, yep. the, the one mistake that Kiljai is making, he keeps leaving the crossbows around a little bit too long. This is the commitment I was looking for. Just go in. He was trying to get Q and peel back the lances so the injured ones went to the back of the formation. You just have to accept this for what it is. A spade is a spade. This wave is not going to kill him. It's the next wave I'm worried about. Playing against the Japanese is like dropping yourself in the middle of a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, a lot of those Lancers are extremely heavily battered. That's why he pulled all of them back. He wanted to avoid the losses. He does lose the Sacred Site, and there is still a breach on his walls. So first and foremost, victory condition canceled for the time being. But more importantly, what Kiljardi needs is time. He needs oh to heal oh these God. Lancers oh back God. up. And he's starting <laughs> to lose villagers. Oh, the body blocks, he tries to pinch him off there, a few villagers going down, and the eco lead is building cat. I wondered if he'd have enough food to pull this off, but the berries, the boars, and no doubt more farms now added in is ticking every box for him and kill Jardy. The other issue is this comp is too slow. Lancers with home blades in the theory seems so smart until you hover over how long they take to produce. It's also the crossbows. It's a pricey unit that struggles against the Onabugeisha. Sure enough, it's good against the knights, but you just don't take prolonged fights where they are out. Yeah, they are good against the samurai, beg your pardon. Yeah. But prolonged fights aren't really a thing here, so by the time they start picking those off, the Onabugeisha are just done butchering the knights. And this mango spam is dangerous. If the mango gets touched at all, Onabugeisha shred these things. Remember, mangoes have a lot of ranged armor, no melee armor. These units are like melee Gatling guns, attacking every 0.875 seconds. Base damage might not look cool, but the damage output is what's insane. Yeah, the raw DPS of those units is actually impressive. And they are not a super expensive units either, so Cat can afford to mass produce them. He's got 37 of them on the field. Dude, Cat, Cat is, uh, <laughs> he's doing the sinful thing we talked about. Japanese players rarely ever feel good about it, but he's actually found the game. It's spearmen on the Begisha. 
The crossbow's gonna do nothing. The lances are gonna do nothing. What makes this sicker, by the way, is with the update to formation, Spearman are always put ahead of Onabagisha in formation. So it means you're not gonna take the losses that need to occur for Kildani to stand a chance here. Backstab coming in. Manganels are gonna make their stand. The cat will have to back away, but still, he has the comp. He has the defense. He Beautiful defense here by Kiljari, though, and as long as those Mangonals are standing, he's gonna be in a good spot. And look at this. Lancer's chasing down the stragglers here. Suddenly, army numbers are equalizing, and the spearmen are Wait, all what? gone. Now, Fudiko, as Wodka is pointing out, is absolutely horrendous for Kiljari, but he lives to see another day, and I think that's what matters for him right now. Well, this is peculiar as well. Kat went back to Samurai. He spammed out like a wave of spearmen and almost like hash baited and has gone back for Samurai. I think that's because he's seeing the lack of food access, and he's like, there's only this many lances, you can't get more, right? Like, it's kind of a smart play, but I think that gap in non-stop push kind of stung him a little bit. It's also probably because he has too much gold. Like, you're seeing this constantly, right? Like, food is the thing running out. This is going to be a big booster, though. Daimyo level 2 is on the way. That's a 25% gathering speed buff to all the farms in Radius. And also, dude, that might only be 200 Bagisha, but with how fast they slap, that could be a heavy hit to kill Jardi's EK. Kiljardi does finish the keep in the middle, though. Critical point, especially because he needs those sacred sites, still. He has zero sacred site control right now, and his keep is going to help solidify his control over the middle part of the map. Still, his access to food is horrendous, and he is going to have to make a farm transition, something that Cat has already done. And also remember, this is not compound of the defender. So that castle yes. isn't a TC. We're not seeing an eco escalation now for Kiljardi. He's one TC. He hasn't even queued up fortresses, right? So yes. that's awkward. On top of that, Kat's made it even more ugly for him. Because you want to know why Kat slowed down? He went for a second TC. Okay, hear me out. This is like, even though there's no anti-siege, it is on the way. Even without anti-siege, this feels like the worst type of Civ to try and charge in. Like, I can't think of any other Civ that could not have cavalry, not have anti-siege, and yet I still not advise going towards them with Mangonels. Like, Oda Begisha are so, so fast. See if he does it right. setting up over here. Uh, I feel like Kiljardi feels like he needs to make something happen. And uh -oh. he doesn't want to play a long game where he builds up farms. This is going to be a now or never for him, I feel. But seeing the infantry, he's just going to pull back. This is bad. Oda Begisha. They were only moving slow because of Adamant. And now they break out. Mangos go down. Kiljardi. He'll make his stand here. But what happens next is what has me most worried. Crossbows are easily going to be reached by the Onibagisha. Night count looking way too small. The siege goes down, and that was the one hope for Kiljardi. I don't know, KP. I, I kind of question this dive in here. I understand why he did it. He felt like he has no future in this game here with no farming and that batter deco. But at the same time, this felt like a desperate effort that was just do from the beginning. The moment the Mangonels were gone, this was uh, this was just a dead effort. And now I feel like there is no chance for recovery here for Kiyojari. These ladies are slicing them up like their sushi. Tastes like chicken. I mean, it's kind of worrisome right now, right? Like Kiljardi just still doesn't have the solution to this. He went for House of Learning. He hasn't got the eco escalation. He hasn't got the cheaper keeps. Where do you go? Right, I feel like your point there, the approach here is set up some walls, go slowly. Just take it step by step, one in front of the other. But I think what got in his head is he realized, huh, I'm 1TC, this is Japanese. I know how ludicrous their food income can be. I've played it enough myself. I think he kind of lost his bottle at that factor. I think he rushed to gun this down. Because, you know, if you can't get a clean end in the next five minutes, that little word Imperial whispers in your ear and you're playing Pele. Yeah, uh, it's, it was a difficult position for Kiyojari from the beginning, but now it's just completely catastrophic. He doesn't have the army count, he had to cancel this keep on this sacred site. Sacred site is gonna get decapped as well, and Cat has breached the walls, he is marching towards the enemy eco. Wait. And you look at that army from Kiyojari, it's, it's, it's nothing special. Four Wait. lancers, nine crossbows, definitely this not an intimidating army. Might be it, Lydico. The deer. He's gonna find him. Tao's oh gonna dear. see it early, but oh, oh dear, dear indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you that these lads have not been a bore, that's for sure. But this might be the final strike to lock in game one. Cat 
Chasing Killjoy the opposition, corral him like he's sheep to the sheepdog. Only these are a pack of wolves ready to munch down. No gate to run through here, nowhere to go. And that is all of Killjoy's food eco about to get pinched. Uh, things went from bad to worse here. All the villagers gone. And with that, Killjoy's chances in game number one as well. Cat coming off strong with the Japanese. You kind of touched on this at the beginning. Great win rate against Delhi. And I think Cat has shown us why. Exactly, right? It's the fact that even if it's all in feudal, they have solutions. Like, he went for the castle build on a slight delay, but you can actually play full feudal against Delhi. No means. You will still break them. This is like the one way Kiljani can maybe hold. I think I like the idea around the walls. He understood what was coming. Oh, Max under Big Isha is always the way. But unfortunately, he still found a way to break through it all. Cat gets in on the siege once more. Mangoes go down, and surely that has to be it. Behind this, Kiljardi doesn't really have the type of economy that can compete anymore. Cat, a fantastic game opening this up. Kiljardi was definitely looking like the favored player based on statistics, based on ranking. But Cat says no. What a game, KP. Very much back and forth. And there were moments where it felt like Kiljari is going to be in a great spot. But then things fell apart. And, you know, to a certain extent, you look back at that one window where both sides had a crippled economy. But obviously, Textile was making a big difference between the two, just at the 15-minute mark, where both players actually got banked up very badly. But Kiljari, he lost a lot more eco than Cat did partially because of that Textiles upgrade that Cat had. I was ready to call it there. When I saw that die by the Dell and the Japanese, I was like, hold on a second, this looks to be it. But then you watch the eco numbers on both sides go down. Then you watch how the health bars just weren't moving. It's crazy how little damage the guards were doing there, but it's to Cat's credit. Like, it's crazy how many times we've watched players just not get textiles and regret it. And the crazy part is that I think, for me, Kiljardi had the warning signs on the wall very early on with those little horseman raids coming in. It's like, okay, I'm up against the player. He's not just going to sit back. He's not going to play standard. He's going to try to do something. It's worth getting textiles. It's worth sacrificing a villager there just to ensure that you don't have to panic. Unfortunately, once the panic set in, Cat was like a dog with a bone, weirdly enough there. Uh, would not let go. Gets the opening game and gets us ready for game number two. We've got an Ambassad versus Marlian matchup. You know, Ooh. Ambassad's looking a bit trash, but I don't, I don't necessarily mind their chances here. But I think they have to find a way of being aggressive. Otherwise, Cat might just remind us how broken Marlians are in competitive. I feel like the issue that Kiljardi is facing over here is that ordinary Abbasid gameplay isn't going to win you this game. Yeah, You don't want to sit back and focus on the eco because if you do that, so will the Marlians and the Marlians will just eat you alive in Castle Age. Mm -hmm. So Kiljardi will need to play a very unorthodox game over here and I'm a little concerned about that, to be honest. As a side note, Kiljari opted to play one of his opponent's home maps over here, Dry Arabia, going into game number two. As we'll be taking a look at a Malians versus Abbasids game. KP, I think it's time. And this is a good setup for Cat, I feel. Exactly that. Like, Cat, he's got to be feeling confident after the first game. Malians in his hands. A strong sieve. I'd say, like, top six, at least... I say in most people's rankings. Other side of it, Kiljardi, he saves a bit of a question mark. Historically, up against the Marlins, they do fare reasonably well, but has to be said, Abbasids have been looking more bad than good at the moment. Hopefully, Kiljardi can solve that. If there's any player that can provide the level of aggression required to shut down Cat, it would be Kiljardi. We saw him attempt it in game one, but fantastic counteroffensive by Cat. But one thing that you always have to keep your eye on, no matter what sieves in his hand, Kiljardi is not a player that is willing to just sit back and chill. Oh, certainly. It's just the big question is what you do with the Abbasids to be aggressive. It's probably one of the most challenging civilizations to be aggressive with long term. Sure enough, you can open a military wing, get some spearmen, get some uh, archers on the, uh, on the board. But Abbasids are just not known for being a civilization that can sustain a lot of early game aggression. I think this is one of the matchups where I actually like Eco Wing. Because, like, if you go Millie Wing, you're forcing them to build a Javelin, and they're kind of okay with that, right? And one Javelin can just kill off the four units. So it's kind of like, eh. He built a building that he probably was okay with building anyways, the Marlians. But if you go Eco Wings, like, Typically, Malian players are greedy son of a guns. They don't tend to just open with units and run out onto the battlefield, right? They kind of chill a little bit more. 
Um, it's all about scout timings, though. Like, Kiljardi, if he can read this right so that the Malian scout is on the other side of the map when he's stacking up, he actually might get the type of advantage that stops any sort of blocker. But it really comes down to where the rotations are happening. And the reason I highlight that is even though Cat's a very talented player, he'll know the timings, I always find these berry sieves throw you off in that regard. And you can see why. Like, he's literally covered two-thirds of the map on his rotation initially before going back. Yeah, you know, I'm deep into thinking when it comes to how an Abbasid player could play this aggressive. I think if you open Horseman, you can start torching down pit mines, and oftentimes that forces the uh, Malian player to invest into army a little sooner than what they would want to. In our case, that would be Dunzos. And I think that's probably the best way for Kiljardi to open this. He is opening wi Military Wink, but I don't think that two Spearmen and two Archers will be enough. Two Javelin Throwers will be more than enough to clean that up. Yeah, like, my thought is, instead of trying to, like, aggro, you just go Greed. But, you know, Kiljardi is doing that Military Wing approach here. Um, looking at the golds, I guess that actually gives some inspiration for it as well. Cat only has one safe gold. This spawn's kind of split. And if you just take a look north, you can actually see that secondary gold and trend third are really far away. So that's usually a negative because it means, like, for example, at Bassets, one of the popular plays for a full feudal is to go mass horsemen. So you play, like, mass horsemen spears or mass horsemen arches. You can try and cut between these, and it strips the Malians of one of their strongest points, which is using their buildings to defend. It, it could be an option. For now, it's going to be Munsa Quarry on the side of Cat. No surprise on that front. One thing I'm looking at here, KP, is that probably the most legitimate secondary pit mine for Cat is going to be the one that's tucked away behind this wood line, the one that Kiltari is just now passing. The other alternative is just so open in the middle of the map that it's near impossible to defend. Yeah, it, it's actually just a death sentence if you try to play for that. It's kind of wild, actually, how split those look. Like, I think that, that goal behind the trees is meant to be a bit close to the base, but the tree lines pushed him away. Like, typically, you don't get three tree lines like this. You get another one on the opposite side of your base, right? Um, but I've been noticing more frequently with Dry Arabia, especially at the moment, you get these very kind of out there spawns, I want to say, where it does leave you a bit more exposed. Like, you can even see it for Kiljardi. The south side of his base is a barren wasteland. Through that, uh, it's just there's just not much over there. Hmm. Now, Spearman Archers heading around. Looks like just from the angle of approach, they weren't heading towards the gold mine up until now. They probably will be contesting that. The scout of Cat is just now passing the um, School of Learning or House of Learning. He sees the military wing, so he knows that there is a group of spearmen and archers heading his way. So I would expect him to drop a range and start getting some javelin throwers out. He also spots Dude. a stone mine, so now he knows that Kiljardi will play multiple town centers. Did he actually see the stables, though? I think he just clipped it. That's he really did. important. Yeah, because that, that's, that's smart big. by Kiljardi. The 1-1-1 one, one, one approach here, like, obviously didn't have the production buildings yet, but having archer, spear, horseman is meant to shut down the mine because your opening of javelins can't do anything. But Kat, he should quickly look to drop Donzos. He's got 300 wood. He's definitely got what he needs. Typically, if you don't scout that play, what a lot of Marlin players will do instead is they will literally just choose to build a ranch. And we have got a ram play on the way. I love this. Uh, it goes back to our discussion of how you play aggressive with Abbasids. And I feel like it's almost an all-in style approach when you invest into rams so early until you realize that uh, there was a bigger discount on the rams. And you're still playing two TCs as Kale Jardy. This puts a massive strain on his economy. But the thing I love about it is that it takes too much time to torch down these buildings. And when you combine this with horsemen, it makes it very difficult for Cat to hold. He cannot just sit back with those long range javelin throwers to pick away at the infantry because he's going to get pushed by the horsemen. And at the same time, if he doesn't fight, he's going to start losing the houses in the pit mine. Lita, it's so much more than that. This, this ram. Uh, I, I coined the term clown car in quite some time ago. And no one... Yeah, like, I hate that term, just so you know. Well, it's going nowhere, mate, because this is the clown car strat. He's built javelins. How do you pro like? How do you solve this problem? You have to send him melee. Come close, please. Come closer. Like, And, and then, you know, this, the one Donzo says is like, okay, come closer. Surprise. Like, the, watch what happens here. Get some range. Kill Jardy. Come on, do it. Spring the trap. 
There we go. Immediately. <laughs> okay, that was the worst place to do that move. Horseman going to arrive as well, though. So one Donzo goes down. Just as another one's arriving. Javelins have to back away from this. And then you just run back over and hop in the clown car. <laughs> The angle from which Kiljardi is attacking is also important. He's trying to pull away these javelin throwers as far away from the PC as possible to make sure he can take them out. And it looks like Cat is just diving into this one. He's willing to sacrifice his forces. He is going to lose the pit mine though. And it looks like he might have just enough to clean this one up. Oh man, the ram not being pulled back is problematic there. I mean, the pit mine goes down, sure, but like you could have maybe kept that alive longer. The question mark now is, was Kiljardi's clown car good enough? He no. killed a few units. He did get a TC. I would say this wasn't actually too bad. Like, the military wing units kind of done what they needed to. This is a very creative build. I was worried he hadn't gathered enough stone yet. But now, Kat, he finds himself in an awkward predicament where he doesn't quite know yet is the more coming, right? So he has to build some extra units in case Kill Judd is going to double down. I actually feel different from you when it comes to the value of this push. There was a trade on both sides. You look at the destroyed value, it's actually better for Cat. Kiljardi took out the pit mine, but it was rebuilt instantly. He had to invest into a ram. He had to invest into a stable and some horsemen as well. When the dust settles, you look at Cat, who still has a good villager count. He's got two pit mines, and he already has a couple of, uh, a couple of cattle working as passive source of um, additional food. Of course, there could be a second wave coming, something that Cat scouts, but it's only three horsemen for the time being. And I feel like we're entering the stage where both players will start focusing on the economy, which usually starts to play out better for uh, the Malians once you get to mid-late um, mid Feudal Age, early Castle Age. Yeah, so here's the interesting thing, though. The Archer Horseman comp, Cat's not... like. I think he's being a bit frugal with his unit production here, right? He's focusing greed a little bit more. Um... The, also, the thing that's always kind of deceptive with the Abbas is they have one of the best, like, built-in, just equal, like, extra elements to the eco, right? They've got the 15% Golden Age, which just kicks in basically around now. Um, then he's playing pocket resources. Berries are also insanely good. That's why I kind of have high hopes for this push. It's like he secured additional berries. There's no pressure coming towards him. Yes, the ranches are strong, but, like, with 2TC plus the fact it's very Golden Age, I think that's what can actually give the Abbas an edge here. In fact, you're kind of already seeing it in the food. Yeah, I'm actually wondering if we're going to see um, Cat going more on the old school side of things. And instead of using the Grand Falani Corral, he's just going to go for the alternative option. Be extremely heavy on gold, play a semi-fast castle, and then just spam out those units with a gold cost. Usually what that does is that it eliminates the need to build up that food eco in Feudal Age and gives you a much better cost age timing. And I think that timing could be devastating against Kill Charlie because right now, I feel like Cat is taking his time building up that food eco, but as you kind of touched on this, given time, Kill Charlie's eco is also going to be pretty good. Yeah, and like you've already got Horde Culture coming on the way, right? We haven't got that for Cat. That food number is going to get bigger. The berries are going to last a while. He's already moving to the south side as well for the eight stack. He could even shift the deer north of his wood line because, like, the reality is, Cat, although he's starting to move out with an army a bit, He's going a bit hard into the Donzos, and the arches haven't been sprung yet. My worry is Cat's going to get a bit too close to this base, and it's going to be like Icarus flying close to the sun. For a cheeky freebie. Not going to be able to get it. Like, that scout would have actually been a big deal, because then you can actually creep up on him with the arches, and by the time he realizes, it's, it's kind of GG. You're too close to get away, right? Um, but I am worried with the way that Cat's rotating. He's getting a bit too close. The wall is up, and there's not a gate. That's the positive. But like realistically, if the archers just approach this now, Cat should lose everything. Where are the archers? Am I blind? Yeah. Like, are they just hiding in the TC? I'm, I'm not a fan of Cat moving out right now. This is usually what you want to avoid as the Malians. You don't want to take premature fights. And I feel like he needs a little bit more time. He either needs to go into Costlage with the resource bank he has, or he needs to turn that into army. But right now he's being out-muscled. And this setup is very similar to what you see from the English, for instance. You have that one death ball, and you cannot afford to lose it. This death ball isn't really a death ball right now. It's more like a small crew. 
Yeah, this is but like eventually classic. it can turn into a death ball if you allow it to grow. And I feel like Cat is risking that growth potential right now. Well, he's only got three jabs here, so he's going to lose the entire army. That's way too many arches. The ambush is sprung. Steel Dower isn't in yet, but it's going to come in well before Undermesh. Big mistakes made. Cat, a classic crap will get off the pot. He's going to start his tech up behind this, but be conscious of what's happening here. He's going to have no military upon tech up against a large abbasid force that can now rush the other side of the map. The way that the Malians have been dominating the competitive scene for a long time was a defensive game which ultimately turned into a massive snowball. A snowball that's being fueled by the passive gold trickle, a snowball that's being fueled by all that cattle. But an integral part of that build is allowing that death ball to build up and playing a very defensive early game. I feel like Cat dropped the gun. I don't know if he just felt like two TCs is too much to handle for him, which I kind of disagree with. Or he just felt like he has an opportunity to punish the opponent that he didn't actually expect Kiljari to have this much. Whichever the case, now he's down to one army, and it doesn't really have that potential to build up his forces quickly. Yeah, I, I think this is like more on Kiljardi playing a really smart game there. Like he only shoot horsemen, he hid the arches for so long, and Kat was like, oh yeah, Donzo's, now I need to do some pressure play while I tech up. Like, I can see where Kat's coming from, but Kiljardi, the, the patience on that archer trap being sprung is crazy. Like a lot of players would have given a slip up a little bit earlier. Like I mentioned around the walls, like go now, surprise him. He waited until he was way too deep to do anything. And now, eco wing on the way. Yes, Kat has his tech up. It's gonna come at a price though. Right, because houses is here, he's got the pit mine. There's plenty of things to be targeted in this area. It's not eco losses, sure, but it could easily be ranch losses. Oh, dude, just take the ranches. Just take them now, dude. They're freebies. Cat literally does not have an army to fight you. I think Cat, like, he has to wait three ranches deep. But wait, kill Jardy. Is he really looking for eco? This is green. I, I, I think he's being cautious. I don't think he knows how little army Cat has. You don't expect this from Malians. You expect them to play very defensive and have a bunch of javelin throwers back at home. <laughs> I think he knows I now. Kiljardi is just not going to realize how little of an army Cat has. You need to be careful these new ones coming out though. Imported armors is on the way, so it's going to make these sofa insanely tanky. I, I think maybe the missing opportunity here actually out of Kiljardi. There was a window that's starting to close now. He's trying to burn down the buildings. Can he do this quick enough? This is actually going to be close. If he blocks this, it breaks Cat. But no, 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 no! Import armors is gonna complete. Oh my god, the difference three seconds make. <laughs> One and done. That aggro was the difference. Plus two armor, and now Cat, patiently waiting, pounces. <gasps> incredible, actually incredible. That one spawner sofa has made all the difference. Kiljardi is gonna lose the entire army to the sofa mass. The game isn't over one way or the other, but it will most definitely be carrying on here. Yeah, this is more reminiscent of the Malian playstyle you want to see in late Feudal Early Castle. Archers at this point just looking for targets, looking to pick off some villagers. And to be fair, they've actually done a lot of damage. They uh, forced well. a lot of idle time, they picked off a bunch of wills. Of course, passive resource income is still there. I think the concern for Cat is that he is still very one-dimensional when it comes to the army. He's got a decent amount of sofas, but he's actually facing one of the best civilizations when it comes to countering heavy cavalry. Yeah, now Kiljardi did still build a leader for that in the end, right? The eco kills help, the fact he kept him blocked in the base. Also, he can just mass spears to now defend against what is a one-dimensional Civ, right, at this stage, just mass sofas. Cat, look at the raw eco difference of 25. Fulani is strong, yes. Doesn't make up that kind of difference, especially when you're up against the Abbasids. And I believe it was an eco wing, right? Which means now Kiljardi, he can get Fertile Crescent, he can go for a farm transition on the cheap, he can get agriculture, and all of a sudden his food income is going to rocket far past cats. Love these wars from Kiljardi. Oftentimes you see this with the Malians when they don't play that classic Dunso plus Javelin composition. They go heavy on the sofas. And with imported armor, these static defenses, towers, town centers, they barely do any damage against them. So they are exceptional when it comes to raiding your eco. So what Kiljardi is doing is basically sectioning off the map such that he makes it near impossible for the sofas to ever break in. Well, a few are going to break through on the south side here. It looks like the rest are rallying over there. They got a sniff of it. 
They sent out the message, but crossbows and spears are coming, and Kildardi has a decent number together already. I think Kat really needs a second element to this comp. He's going to have to retreat away, and that's unfortunate. It means that Kildardi should be able to get these walls up. And at that stage, it is just going to be a raw 25-plus eco lead, one that continues to grow in a 2v1 TC situation. Of course, that's a nominal lead, 25 eco because you do have to consider all that passive resource income coming in for the Mali Employer. Three pit mines now, and of course, a bunch of cattle as well. So when you look at the overall resource income, it's actually still a little better for cat. But Ma the Malian power spike, it's starting to fade away. This is yeah. exactly the window where Malians win most of their games, this early castle, maybe mid castle period. And from this point onwards, the Abyssids start picking up. They start leveraging that massive eco they've built. And they are one of the best civilizations when it comes to mid to late game tech. A lot of efficient technologies like boot camp, phalanx. These techs, they will start winning fights for you soon. Yeah, my worry is like, this is looking ugly already for Kat, and 10 vodka shots ain't gonna make it look pretty, right? We just saw Agriculture mm -hmm. queued up alongside Fertile Crescent. Kiljardi, this is the weak point, right? He's gonna have to get a lot of wood together, scale into farms. Once he's there, unlimited spear them plus archers or crossbows you're choosing at that stage sure he's adding in archers now but it means these sofas are basically handcuffed and right now with the walls being up it's difficult to strike quick enough in a way that Kiljardi doesn't notice and react it's a very long wall of palisades it's extremely difficult to defend and i think Kiljardi realized that sofas will hit him one thing he might not know is how many sofas there are and that's a lot of sofas 25 oh, that's of them on the field sick that is on a misclick. He's queuing up camera riders. I love it. It's a great unit, but he needs numbers. At the same time, on the other side, we're seeing Musafari warriors being mixed in by Cap, but he's also silently building up a force of archers with poison arrows, and that could be the secret weapon that annihilates Kiljardi. This is sick, though. Kiljardi, he understands running back there is death anyway. You're just not trading, you're losing. So what does he do? He sends the army in, and Cap blinks first. He's running at home. The mind games are insane in this one. Cat, he, he only leaves two sofas to raid and he pulls everything back. Okay, this At the same is time, incredible. Kyojari needs to be cautious. 16 archers, soon to be with poison arrows, can easily clean this up. He's building a mango here. The confidence on Kyojari in this one. Double mango. He says, fight me, damn it. <gasps> Dude, this is way too greedy. There's no way. Just like cancel them. You got what you wanted, Kiljardi. You begged for a fight. And Kat is here. He's still trying to build it. He's actually going to try to get it off. Spearman. Defend against this. Sofa panic rush in. And the man goes online. He's building a second one. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my god. Kiljardi. The army is going to get cleared up. He finally forced the fight he was looking for. And you know, anyone who's thinking, like, oh, why the hell would Kat come back to deal with this rabble? It's the ranchers. That's why Kiljardi knew that would work. Cat couldn't afford to have those go down and the cows die. He wouldn't be able to afford anything at that stage. It's such a sick read by Kiljardi. Most of the sofas are gone though. And I think this is critical here for Kiljardi. He is going to get cleaned up, which is a painful loss. But in exchange, he took out all but a handful of those sofas. Now he's facing a lot of poison arrow archers. But one thing that these archers are bad against is mass Abbasid archers something that Kiljardi is working towards. You know what's funny? Like, he can just beat this whole army by building spears and arches. Uh, because the spears are actually really good against Musafadi. Like, really, really good. Because more of them can attack you than vice versa. And Musafadi, although cheaper, like, spearmen are about as cheap as they come. Add in boot camp as well. And it's like a brain-dead comp that's very simple. And because it's so cheap, that means you can also afford these mangonels that destroy cat. Uh, a lot of Musafari warriors out there, though. 20 on the field, and they can go into stealth mode. We've seen this KP in some competitive games before. Stealth mode Musafari warriors jumping the siege before the archers engage. Don't sleep on that here for Kat. Leader, it's going to happen again. Kat's moving for a raid. He's going to have to turn around to defend. Mangoes are coming in. Uh, come on, Kat. This, this time, it actually is the right call. You can't go for a trade. Yeah, he doesn't need to. This time around, his army is much more substantial. Yeah, going to try to break through the walls. Mango boys are moving in. If they hit that wood line, quick pull knock, away just knock. in time by Kat. Oh, they don't see the villagers. You can still oh, the blind the fire! Oh my god, that was way too close. 
round attack can be devastating in positions like that. They're still going to send a few in onto the pit mine location. It's moving across by Moon. This is an expensive army if it gets hit from the back. And he is actually kind of abandoning the mangonels of the dive through here, looking for the villagers' car. So far, they're coming back. Something. They're looking for the loop around. Safadi. Looking pretty funny there. Nice little dodge away with the extra movement speed. Spreewell does come out, but guys, Spreewells don't win this. If the mango just touches them once, Archer being pushed away. Spearman and Archers are going to engage. Moon Safadi will now look to just leak around the back, so they will eventually clear up this siege. But still, even with an army loss like this, Behind this, Kiljardi is so far ahead. 35 eco units. Look at the raw food count. Yeah, he should just keep sending wave after wave of troops to take the fight for the enemy, and he keeps getting cleaned up. But while doing so, he's taking good fights, and I think that's what matters, KP. You look at the destroyed value, it's kind of neck and neck. It's not like he is getting cleaned up in a decisive fashion. Every single one of these fights, he takes a lot of enemies with him. And at the end of the day, especially given that he managed to kill quite a few villagers, now he's got double the villager count, a fortified base, the relics advantage, and a full farm transition complete. 50 villagers difference, even those uh, pit mines and the cattle cannot offset. It's just absurd. It's kind of like Kiljari just like going, oh yeah, look how much economy I've got. Just, just to let you know, like, you want a GG yet? No, okay, I'll send the next wave. You know, it's like Cat right now wishes he had John Dark, so at least he was getting levels out of this, because it's the only upside he'd have right now. Despite the fact he's got a bigger army, that's not going to last long. It's not going to stand the test of time. The crazy part about Fulani is it has a cap, it has a threshold. And Marlins, they've reached that. Yeah, we talked about this, KP. I think the window is closing rapidly for the Malians now that the Abyssin Eco is online. Army count is still in the favor of Cat, and he's got 19 sofas. But now he's facing an increasing amount of well-upgraded spearmen and a lot of siege that he doesn't really have tools to deal with. As I'm saying that, Springboards are rolling in. They do get a couple of freebie hits on those mangonels before Kill Charlie pulls them back. Kill Charlie might want to cancel that Springle. That's, that's, yeah, there you go, buddy. Just in turn. That's kind of expensive otherwise. This is a choke point, though. Kill Charlie, He wants him. Dude, this is, this is an overextension right now. This is an overextension. He's going to dive in. Uh, backs away just in time. Mangos didn't turn around, so it looks like it was a bait attempt by Cat, but Springles, they're getting a bit too far forward. Oof. That was almost incredibly dicey. Two Mangos and choke point pushed like that. Cat would lose half the army, so good time to back up. Good read by Kiljardi to use the territory. We're getting closer to an Imperial window here. He's about to be popped. He's got 2k food in reserve, and he has about what he needs in terms of gold. So Imperial should be ready to go by about 28 minutes for the Abbasids. Um, Sooner. I think Kiljardi is about to head to Imperial, which is a little you know, concerning if he loses his army here. Looks like he's going to bounce on this one. He's got a lot of stone, though. He might want to drop some forward keeps here, and he looks like he's looking for an opportunity here to kind of shelter his in Asia. Oh, cat. Dude, I feel like he's kind of over-microing the, the Springles here, right? They're being pushed so far back, they can't get trades. The Mango's holding him hostage. And I thought maybe Kiljardi would need a trade where he can't just hit the tech up. He needs to get more troops out, but no. He's fine. Culture Wind gets queued up. Military Academy is also set up here. Mangonels are going to get a big wallop there. And Cat is now about to be an entire age behind in the game where Kiljardi has double the villages. Normally, you don't like moving out of your um, out of your base with your army when you're aging up. You cannot afford to lose that army. But here, it's a little different. Kiljardi knew that he is going to take good fights with them. And instead of staying back at home, he's actually moving out and kind of using this aggression to draw away the attention from the fact that he's aging up. He's going to have no trouble getting to Imperial, and he's got a massive resource bank. Even if he loses this army, he can replace it very, very quickly. And he just dropped keeps on the big stones, right? So he's secure. I think he actually done one on the south and the north side. He had well over a thousand stone. So he's not going to run out of resources anytime soon. This whole idea of mining OP, infinite gold, doesn't really apply here. In fact, one of those keeps is being dropped in the center here. That's going to force a fight from Cat. He doesn't want to have to rush in, though. Like, the way it kind of rallies your troops together, Mangos will pick you apart. So impressive plays by Kiljardi, claiming two big chunks of the map going Imperial Age and still winning fights all at the same time. I do not know the last time I saw a Malian game go into Imperial. Nine out of ten times, they win this game in early mid cost lane. But not this time around, Kiljardi is going to get an opportunity to get to Imperial. 
Yeah, it takes a lot of grit to hang around that long. Or is it Griot? I always forget. Either way, it just doesn't look good. Tech up comes out. Cat. Now he has to take the fight. He has no choice. Like, your opponent just teched up. If you can't punish him, it's over. And sadly, you could not punish him. This army is just better from Kiljardi. It just feels too much. Passive resource income is the thing that usually wins the game for the Malians, but not in this case. The eco deficit is just way too big. And Cat with no map control, a fully boomed Abbasid player now coming in with the imp upgrade. Sure. This just feels too much like to handle. I don't want to look at a Maldian base and see two TCs being built ever. I mean, like that. I just vomited a little in my mouth for him. Um, this is this is gruesome. We're now seeing hand cannons on the way that have boot camp, right? Very strong elite Gulam tech coming in. Preservation of knowledge guaranteeing those university techs are very cost efficient. No cap. Ryan's kind of on the wall, right? Like he has a small window to strike here. Once those screens get shot triggers, or we see Culverins coming out. Manganels are going to destroy this fight. So this right here is probably the best fight you're going to see Cat take for the remainder of this game. And I'm still not convinced. That is pretty gruesome. Yeah, this, this is one of those moments where Cat just needs to dive. But realistically, he's got a no chance of winning this fight. But staying back at home won't do him any good at this point. This is just a game that spiraled out of control. And we are looking at a tie series here, KP, in just a matter of moments. In this best of five, Kiljardi strikes back, and he will make the score 1-1 in just a second. Please walk into my mango, he says. I mean, I can't. Uh, you must be just processing the loss. There's genuinely no way you get back into this. By the time you're taking Imperial Age, they're on top of you when you're doing it. Um, the interesting thing is actually how Gulam match up against Musafadi. Like, Gulams are actually really good against this entire comp because of the double strike. Musafadi, although they get bonus damage versus heavy, they also have no armor. So they get clubbed down pretty quick. Add in the Abbasid Spearman, sometimes just soaking the damage or stabbing from behind. It's a DPS exchange that actually favors Gilgardi. And then we talk about the backside, it's archers, squishy units against Gulam. Like, it just all looks so gruesome for Cat. Secret is now locked in. Elite Army Tactics is about to complete in a few seconds, and I think that should be the point where it's very obvious. I mean, it should be obvious by the fact you're being shot in the face by hand cannoneers that this is over. But apparently Cat, he's a glutton for punishment, and usually you have to pay for this type of spanking. GG comes out, game two to kill Jardy. We're gonna get some distance in this one. What a neck and neck series, KP. Both of these games very much back and forth, and there were definitive moments where it felt like Cat can snowball the game, but you look back at those small things that went wrong, especially the fact that he lost a lot of momentum by having his initial army cleaned up. I think that's where things started going bad. And that's what kind of unlocked Kiljardi's real potential to build up this mid-late game economy, which ultimately snowballed the game. Yeah, I think the critical moment in that game was actually the, the, the aggro trade, where because he was assaulting onto the ranch, instead of actually going for his own die with the sofa, Cat panicked. It's classic Mullins, right? They, they love one thing and one thing only, cows. Someone has to in this world. And, you know, because he sees the cow as a friend, almost like it's the gods that they, they worship day and night, he has to come back to protect it. Had he broke through that wall with, what was it, 20, 25 so far? Had he raided through that economy, ravaged it, the damage that could have been done there. But when they get into a game of poker, Kiljardi proves that he should be pay, uh, playing for a ring or a belt here. Gets him on the board and leads us into a third game where we're going to be looking at an Ibid Mongol matchup on Rocky Canyon. Ibid's been shook quite a bit since the changes, especially around Advancement Wing. We've seen a lot of different iterations. Um, I'm curious how Kiljardi wants to play this. He's one of the players that does occasionally play what I call the discount of Bassets, which is basically you play feudal units and then after 20 minutes of feudal, you sit there and go, why didn't I pick a Bassets? Another one, by the way, where one of the players ends up picking the opponent's home map over here. So Cat strikes back with his choice of a home map. He is going to pick the opponent's home map, Rocky Canyon. So after this game, we are going to be left with one home map remaining for both of these players. But we're heading into Rocky Canyon here. Ayubids versus the Mongols to get into game number three here. Once again, this is a decider set between these two players, the winner is going to qualify for the Elite Classic 2. Man, what a fun one. Just thinking the sieves we've got remaining. I mean, th this is usually a stage of the draft where things become a little bit more predictable, I guess you could say. 
um, you know, coastal cliffs. We're probably going to be looking at English versus maybe French there. I could see working quite well. Bridges might be uh, Chinese versus Yuji and I'm vomiting or an HRE versus or the dragon. But whatever it's going to be, we're going to have to wait to see. It's time for game number three. We've got Kiljardi versus Cat, Ibids versus Mongols. And we're heading on in to good old Rocky Canyon. Welcome to game number three here on Rocky Canyon. We have Kilcharty with the orange color to north. And down south, Cat is going to be playing the Mongols with the color blue. Of course, KP, first thing we're looking at in the case of a Mongols game is early aggression. Let's see what Cat has in store for us. The TC spot isn't really spectacular, to be honest. It's um, actually pretty far away from all accessible gold. Uvu spot isn't astonishing either, just a unlucky map generation for a Mongols player here, you feel. Plenty of wood. Uh, that's True. literally all I have positive to say about that. <laughs> like, it is pretty bad. Just, you <laughs> always have that, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always the thing you're going to go for, and that's kind of sad in a lot of situations. You know, he could have maybe, like, plopped the TC next to the Uvu on the wood line and went for some weird multi-TC build. I have seen a few Mongol players do that, but I don't think Kat's one of them. Funnily enough, one of his teammates, 3D Mikos, is one who frequently does that, actually. Um, but... In this type of game, there is the option for trade, right? So TC booming doesn't really feel as desirable. Um, the issue with the idea of going trade, though, is if this is a fast castle Ibit build, Camel Lancer slap. So I'm kind of leaning towards the idea of Deerstone. I'm actually a really big fan of Deerstone. I think Deerstone right now is underrated for Mongols. Yeah, the problem with the Silver Tree is that, as you said, Camel Lancers will just shut the whole thing down. It's one of the most impressive high mobility units in the game. It's a unit that gives you an insane amount of damage output with the lands. It's also a unit with high mobility, but it's a unit that hard counters most highly mobile cavalry units. So it's extremely difficult to chase them down and get rid of them, which makes them an impressive raiding unit. Yeah, I, I had to stop chuckling when you said Camel Lancers are really good. Uh, <laughs> they situationally, are. yeah. Like, situationally, they're very useful. So, like, the big issue Camel Lancers usually have is you need a prolonged charge to do more damage than a standard Lancer, right? But a prolonged charge is very predictable and very manipulatable, right? Like, I can force you towards Spears and you have to cancel. Oh, um, oh yeah. Direct fights, I, I have to agree with you. I think yeah. it's more about the rating potential and Agreed. how it would shut down trade. Agreed. And that's where it's useful against traders specifically. Like, I like it specifically for that. I actually, for like complete disclosure, think too many IB players play Camel Lancers and they play it way too long. Like, I've seen players go 20 plus Camel Lancers and not stop and then lose the game. It happens all the time. But as an opening raiding unit, very effective, I agree, especially against the Silver Tree play. And that's another reason I like Deerstone. Getting Yam on your infantry early on, you know you're going to be behind on age, right? It's very hard to match the IB timings in the Castle Age with Mongols. So just having Deerstone keeps your villagers safe against those raiders and allows Spearman to more easily counter those attacks. And it's Silver Tree. I okay. feel like Cat is playing for a massive upside, and we could have one of these games where it's either a masterclass or a complete flop. I'm not necessarily against it, especially because this is one of his opponent's home maps. Yeah. But still, I feel like... Cat is not going to play a safe game here. He's going to try to play this oh. the trade way and see what the Iobits can do against that. Okay, that's actually a little bit better. Um, that's impressive. Kiljardi didn't go for the military wing opening, so he actually doesn't have the Desert Raider to just take the trade out. Like, that's a really effective tool. Even though you don't get the bonus damage versus Cav anymore, you still hit hard in melee, and then you can just start a step with ranged attacks. Instead, it's the growth wing. But Kiljardi's getting good value out of that. I've been a stickler for this. I've basically had my ruler out when in the classrooms. I've been thumping the fingers of players that don't do it. Uh, look at his berries. He hasn't exhausted any of his berries. Kiljardi's doing this for a good reason. If you leave at least one berry on each of those patches, then the Iobids with the growth wing get plus 50 to all of them. Vod vodka in, in, in the base of orange. There we go. Okay, I, I'm going to slap his fingers. He depleted one of them. But if you look at the berries, like if you click on them, he's moved beyond some of them. So like, look at them now. So the one the one closest on the south side should probably be at like um, 63 berries or something. I'm just saying yep. one. Okay, so he did deplete one, kind of a naughty boy, but his intent was to split up between all the berries because if you do this, that's an extra 300 food. And I've seen so many IB players go growth wing. And by the time they tech up, three of those berry patches have already been exhausted. It's really bad. Cat playing into stables, a couple of Kashyyyks will make their way through, and 
one thing that we need to kind of highlight here, KP, is that Cat has a very low amount of sheep to work with. He almost depleted the sheep under his town center, so he was actually forced to add a pasture right next to that over. Yeah, Kiltrani went for a different build because he actually clubbed sheep himself, and that's why the berries lasted so long. Like, we were seeing him go out late. Um, the interesting thing is if you do do that extra micro I was talking about, you can just have, like, six people on berries and not exhaust any of them. Um, but that's a that's a nice approach. Like, I've noticed players struggle to keep up with that detail. It's easy to forget. So clubbing some sheep's not a bad idea considering you start with a few. And if you split your eco between the two, sure, berries are better, but you guarantee the extra. And now we're entering the Keshik phase. This is pretty readable. I imagine Kiljardi scoured out that silver tree. Anytime a Mongol player is going to go trade, they're going to go Keshik. It's the way they're able to do that comp. So playing as the Ayabids, you have a big smile on your face when all you have to do is get the pokey spears out. <laughs> spears on the way. As uh, we do have a pretty substantial commitment from Kiljardi towards gold. Uh, makes you wonder if he wants to play a semi-fast castle here. And let's not forget, he yeah. still has the option to use the discounted age up to castle age, and that is actually very, very cost efficient uh, when you're trying to go up to castle age. Oftentimes we see that being used for feudal age age ups, like we've seen that uh, earlier today. But for castle age, the discount is actually very substantial. I don't like it much now, but this might be one of the games where it's acceptable because he took growth wing already, and you don't want to go desert raiders. Oh, wait. No. What? Please um, tell me he misrallied. Like, I, I think he misrallied. I thought that they were trapped for a second. Okay, okay, he just misrallied, thank God. Dude, I thought that they somehow found a buggy spot there. I was about to have a heart attack, dude. <laughs> it's just, can you imagine if one wolf had trapped two traders? I mean, this is still pretty bad. Like, one trader's almost dead to wildlife, and they've been AFK. Oh, my lord. I mean, they will oh, no, survive is... here, but it, it has been a banged up trader, and now... The Lancer charges into the Spearman. <laughs> Value is just massive. He gets away, but uh, this is just not the way that Cat imagined the start of this game. Kill Charlie is on the way to Castle Age, folks. I, I tell you what, if you're not finding this game entertainment, you're barking mad. This is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> the grief from the wolves there. Body block attempt there by Cat to protect, but trade is going to go down. I'll just come out, but that is worthwhile. And it is going to be the Advancement Wing play. The reason why Advancement Wing makes a lot of sense here is because logistics is really cool right now, but because it's Keshik, you can't risk it. This just gets you up quickly. It gets you into Lancers, and Lancers absolutely peel the skin off of Keshiks. Oh, they certainly do. And this is where we get to that domain where Camel Lancers, they will just start roaming the map, so say goodbye to these traders, I guess. Especially considering that Cat has basically nothing that can deal with them. No, it's it's worrisome as well because how far out that gold is, you can't high prioritize gold, and if he doesn't hit the gold, he's hitting the traders, right? Like, this is exactly what we highlighted is why Camel Arts is the play. Can we check Kildai's base? I imagine it is yeah, gonna be a stable drop, right? The funny thing is that he can pump Camel Arts, and now he already has a rack to so slowly go into Gulums. And Gulums is like the I'm under your TC and not leaving element of the build that Cat won't have an answer to. Oh, we might have our quickest game here, my friend. Um, yeah, this, this feels um, this feels bad for Cat. I feel like Ayubids, it's not the most unprecedented civilization pick on this map ever, but it definitely feels like, to a certain extent, a counter pick to the Mongols. And we've actually seen an uptick in the trade builds on this map um, recently, not just in this tournament, but also uh, back in the past, like one or two tournaments where we had this map frequently played. And I feel like in many ways, this build that we're seeing from Kiljardi over here is a great response to a trade build, especially a trade build from the Mongols. Yeah, I mean, Silver Tree feels appropriately named because on this map, like genuinely Mongol players like the crows, right? If they see shiny, they want shiny. But, you know, when you're up against cavalry comps, it's problematic. It's even hard up against someone like French because they can raid you with knights and Keshik seem nice, but the scalability just doesn't feel great. In this game, it's impossible now because the Lancers not only are castle age, heavy cav they also have the camel on ease so like your only answer is fits but you don't have yam so you don't have mobility and now you have to defend the entirety of the map there's one yeah. thing mongol players suck at doing is defending in general the issue that you run into when you are trying to face camel lancers raiding you is the fact that you don't have that combination of mobility and combat potential against them you either can beat them in battle or you can chase them but you cannot do both and the annoying thing is, like, Kiljadi, you already saw the, the interesting micro approach there, like having 
camels come from multiple directions is really important. Because a counter to the eye of charge there is when you see a camel lancer charging you, you turn around. You actually absorb the charge because they'll catch you. So it minimizes the damage because the base damage is lower. From that angle, you can't do it. Like if Kiljardi comes from left and right, you can stop one charge, but then you fully absorb the other. It's like really frustrating to deal with. And this is already getting frustrating, right? This is the first wave of Camel Lancers. Kiljardi is so confident about his position, he's massing them all into one big wall. <laughs> the amount of walls in this bloody area. <laughs> oh, we're gonna get a message from, um, from Peta at this rate. Camel Lancers on the way. Charge complete. Unease is there, and it's only a handful of spears, though, to work with. Cat is doing his best to stand and fight, but this just feels like a desperate effort at this point. I mean, now you have to reinvest in spears, so you're even further yep. away from Castle Age, and you haven't actually killed anything. Like, this is this is about as bad as it gets. Um, um, it's really... He's got zero destroyed value, KP. It's yeah. 1310 against zero. He hasn't killed a single unit this game. He won't kill a single unit. Like, this outpost is going to go down before he can kill off one of the Camel Lancers. Uh, <laughs> you want this is before Undermesh. Oh, he might get a kill. Hey, there we go! That's 200 of, actually, that's infinite more destroyed value for Cat. He's got this in the back. No, I can't. I just, I can't. Oh, man. Like, Kiljani has more military than you and some of his spears, but actually half of it is literally just camels. Cat uh, is just mass producing archers at this point, combined with spears. He's trying to keep that tower alive, but it's just a desperate effort at this point. He might somehow survive, but it's going to be very similar to the previous game. He survives, but what's next? Dude, he's trickling Spearman out. This is the worst thing you can do here. Like, this is full panic mode. Like, trying to rally to hold that outpost just killed any percentage chance he hasn't getting back into this. Um, now, the Spear on the backside at least going to get cleared up, but you can't trade anymore. The Camel Lancers have blocked you out. We should be seeing a transition. I'm expecting a Moss drop and probably a double rack soon because the follow-up play now, you could just keep going Camel Lancers or you can go Dervish and then use the savings to spam Gulams out. Looks like for now he's going to keep going camels, but I think the winning element is to get into the infantry. I would love to see a dervish, by the way. At least yeah. one, but preferably more. Because one thing that Kiljardi could do to leverage this map control even more is to start collecting relics. He's only playing one TC, so he's got a somewhat fragile eco. But right now, Cat is in no position to contest the relics, so Kiljardi could easily pick them up. Here we go. Gulams, Dervish on the way. Camel Lancers starting to ride into the main base. He knows if Cat's going to get back in this, he has to tech up, right? So he's waiting for it. Like, he's looking for it. Kurotai is also the only way you can play this. Step readout just kills you outright. You just got to accept that, like, you're not going to get trade right now. You need, essentially, your discount Castle Age. As in, you don't have veteran C, but you have the damage buff of Kurotai. Even that might not be enough, though, because Cat's oh, yeah. army, his grand army is 16 large. <laughs> Yeah, that's the problem. Like, damage buff. Um, good luck buffing basically zero damage output because that's what Cat has right now. Also, he's getting healed, man. All the spearmen chase out those lances. Second wave comes in for the reinforcements. This is it right now. Kiljardi is a hungry monkey and Cat is the banana. Healed left, right, and center. And this is literally the same issue on the outpost on the north side being replicated. He's sending in spears one by one to die against mass lances. Yeah. Now you're looking at this, and it's no longer a matter of if, it's a, or it's not a matter of who anymore, it's a matter of when. Oh my god, no. This, this game is going to be over before that Kurotai unpacks. He hasn't got the pack <laughs> He's going to buff four archers. That's all that he's getting out of the Kurotai. Got him! <laughs> well, villagers are definitely going home in a body bag. And Kat is, um, well, he's looking like he's drowning here, which... As we know, cats don't like water. I think this is just one of those games you accept. It was classic Ibids. There's no coming back. He's now heavily behind on Eco. Relics are being yoinked left, right, and center. I, th there really is nothing for Cat in this game. Absolutely nothing. He's down by 14 Eco. He's going to lose out on most of the Relics. He's got no trade. His game plan has been completely shattered. And, uh, I mean... I think it speaks for itself that he wasn't even able to replace the Ovu that now got depleted simply because his map control is a flat zero. I legit think Kat has been reading way too many anime uh, mangas. Like, he's he's heard about those like, hero stories. He's like, episode one, then by episode 20, he's like, wow, the comeback. That guy shouldn't have won. 
this is not one of those stories. I mean, Kiljardi is a very talented player. He's not going to... like the, the degree to which you'd have to throw this right now, I think you genuinely have to pick up your desktop and throw it out the window. Yeah, I value that Cat is fighting on because to a certain extent, and that's something that we always highlight in broadcasts like this, we see the big picture. Players yeah. do not necessarily do that. He probably, well, he certainly knows that he's behind, but especially in a game like this, especially a game that would put his opponent onto match point, he's fighting on and yes. he's trying to see if his opponent is going to slip up. I think what he's unaware of is how big of a slip up this would have to be for Kill Charlie to lose this game. Yeah, because he doesn't know about the second TC. And like in fairness, and, and this is what I'm waiting for, is like the Gulams haven't been sprung yet. Once that like once the extra element of the comp comes in, I think that's where he's gonna be like, okay, yeah. Well played, well played. I mean Kurotai can do some miraculous things, and Maganel might like help you a bit, but you know, if, if we check Kat's vision on the game, you'll see the point that Lytical is making. Like there's literally nothing he sees right now. You know, he's as blind as a bat. So, a cat, he's going to need a little push over the edge. I think that's going to make it a little bit more sour, a little bit more frustrating when he realizes. He doesn't Honestly. even have enough sheep. That's how bad his Wait, position is, folks. He has one pass. Like, okay, two pastures. He has one pasture on the Uvu. I mean, in fairness, he lost 15 villages. So, how many pastures <laughs> do you really need, I guess? Um, uh, the army count isn't looking up. Uh, very much in the favor of Kill Chart. It's only 22 against 15, but the quality, it's triple the army value right now for Kill Chart. He's got a bunch of Camel Lancers, but it's no longer about the army at this point, KP. It's about, as you kind of touched on that, two TCs, and Kill Chart is going to be like, okay, if you are not coming out of your base, I will force you out of it because I will capture the third sacred site. He also has four relics, and the fifth one is also easily accessible for him. Kill Chart has all the map control he wants. One of the tough things here as well is like, Usually I'd highlight a recovery point is the defending player can use Siege against like a slow moving element in the army and defend with Spears. Like, you know, I, I call it a Chinese strat, right? Like they just nest the bees and Spears. Um, the problem here is like Iobid's build in, in the field, right? The, I always found like of the original Civ that that was one of the more interesting matchups is Mongols versus Abbasids because they can both just react and build Siege on the fly. And that happens here too. So, you know, Coral Tiger knew some miraculous things, but the Kiljardi to me, like what you just highlighted, he doesn't have to come out. He can just park himself here, macro up. Maybe it takes an extra five or six minutes. Cat has to come out soon, though. Like, gold-wise, he must be tapping that vein pretty hard on the backside. Um, tapping to the point that I imagine he's, like, already 1.5, 1.6k through. Yeah, it, it, that's not going to last very long when you're sc scaling Siege here. And was that Gur again? Oh, dude. <laughs> Has he been using Gurs as outposts? I think he has been. <laughs> <laughs> but the Gur is pricier than the outpost. Yeah, but it can move, right? <laughs> true. <laughs> but it doesn't give Yam. Oh, well, that's true. But I think, I, honestly, I think if you're coming out that far that you can use Yam, you're probably going to die anyway, right? Like, I feel bad for Cat because you probably feel like you're, a, a, you're on an island surrounded by sharks right now. He's just and waiting someone to drops see a nuke on you, yeah. Yeah, it's like all of a sudden a boat drops from the sky because someone deactivated the flying Dutchman cheat, right? It's, I think the thing for Cat is he's banking on a mistake being made because the reality is, like, the reason why Cat hasn't called this is that I think one thing that gets lost, especially in 1v1s, 1v1s is not about playing perfect. It's about making the least mistakes. And he's banking on Kiljadi making a mistake. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. One of the things, again, is that he doesn't know about the second DC. So in his mind, first of all, he actually managed to decap one of the sacred sites, so credit where he's due. That wasn't an easy thing to accomplish on the opposing side of the map. But if he doesn't know about the extra town center and the eco build of, of Kiljari, and given that he didn't see all the Gulam and crossbow build up, he might just say, look, I just need to take out these Lancers and I might have a shot at this. But when you look at the big picture, and I think this is why Kiljari played this smart, he didn't overcommit. He didn't want to finish the game right now. He just accepted the fact that he's got an advantage and made it into a five times bigger advantage. Yeah, I, I honestly feel like Kiljari is leading him on right now. Cat's like, one day, can we be friends? Like, yeah, I've, just, I've got other friends at the moment, but soon. Okay. Because, like, what's happening here is Kiljari is only showing the lances. This is the first time he's going to show anything else. And Kat, his soul's about to be shattered, man. The size of this army. 
55 versus 17. Now, that's 6 to 15 siege as well. But only two mangoes? I... Uh, you know, I wouldn't hold my breath. This fight will probably be over before I run out of air. 58 army against 17. It's a 146 population against 83. If, I feel like once Cat sees this, he might not even see until the end of the fight. He's just going to tap out once he sees that army. Did he, like, I think he saw two thirds of the army. Like, the army was so big compared to his vision. I think he didn't even see all of it yet. He's like, whoa! That's a bit. Okay, yeah, but if you look at it from the side, I mean, it's so even Kyojari more. is going to drop a keep. He has basically all the blacksmith upgrades he needs. And he has, like, an army four times as big as his opponents. It's actually ridiculous how safely Kyojari plays this. You know, like, better safe than sorry. You know, if someone's going to just hide in the hole, go build a nuke and drop down the hole. Like, we've all watched Starship Trooper. No one wants to go down those holes. We know how that ends. It's going to be a keep drop. It's going to be Siege. And then it's going to be a bitter taste of death for Cat. I'm, like, trying to figure out a way. Like, Cat, Sully's out. Like, we're watching Lord of the Rings, Two Towers. But the problem is, in that movie, they were actually genuinely going to die if it wasn't for the third player. There is no third player here. So, like, he's going to have to sully out. Oh, God. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. <laughs> that must be sad. That must I be mean, just very sad. And he has it... a type? <laughs> Does it matter? No. <laughs> uh, Springles? Okay, yeah, but here we go. Ready? How dare you touch my baby Springle? Lance is going. Spearmen are going to clash, and yeah, this is it. There's just too many units here. Manganels get a good hit. Kurokai with the extra damage, but you just have no front line, man. <laughs> it's such a painful game. Cat, this is GG. Match point for Kiljardi. Cat, man, dude, I hope you got some metal juju. I hope you got a 3D coach here to pat you on the back and give you a talk that inspires the nation right now, because this game has to feel demoralizing. And I'm actually wondering about the mental state of Cat heading into game number four with this, because when you look at this, oftentimes you don't have the chance to touch on player mental, but it's a thing, it's something that the players often point out. Cat was in a losing position for 10-15 minutes. Kiljari was in a winning position for 10-15 minutes, subconsciously, that gives you and takes away momentum for these respective players. So, for Kiljari, he's going to head into game number four here with a high amount of confidence, whereas for Cat. You know, there might be some shakiness at the beginning of game number four as a consequence of this demoralizing last 15 minutes. All right. It was all strategic. Kiljadi didn't just do that to secure the win. He lives in Finland. I think Kat lives in Russia. So um, it's later where Kat is right now. Checkmate. Boom. We figured it out. Um, yeah. Brutal beatdown in that game. I mean, you know, I, I hope it didn't seem like we're being, uh, like, unfair. Like, this is, sometimes in RTSs, you reach this very clear stage where the game is over. But the reality is that we can see that and a player can't. It's always important yes. to emphasize that. Um, Kat, from his perspective, he's like, it's one TC still. Yes, he has relics. It's really hard. But Kurotai is like, it's like Castle Age Plus. I can out micro him, I'll outplay him. Unfortunately, the double TC and the, the comp, it just made it very clean for Kiljardi. Uh, means we do find him on match point. And you know what? I thought this was maybe going to be English versus French, but my, oh, my. Oh my. What a peculiar matchup. You know, I don't think, and I've cast, I think at this point, like I may have cast more Coastal Cliffs games than anyone because I just nerd around watching the scrims. I don't think I've once in Order of the Dragon. Interesting option, especially against the English. Now, hear me out. Dark Age Spearman is a weird option. It's an option against all civilizations. It kind of has a wacky matchup against the English because, of course, the English villagers can shoot with bows. Having said that, technically, with that Spearman, if you can delay the Feudal Age of the English, this whole concept of longbow buildup is just thrown out the window. Yeah, so... Oh, God, dude. I hate... Crackity, I hate you so much. My brain is like... I'm just recalling a game where he rushed... He outpost rushed after a proxy rax an English player, but that was DQC, who genuinely... he he Every year is the year of the turtle to him, so it's kind of different. But... I'm trying to think if there's like a way you can proxy racks and outpost at all. I think it'd be a little bit wonky. Big shout out, by the way. I did just see a bunch of Anon gifters coming in. 20 gift subs. Bunch of people have been subbing, by the way. Keep them pumping in. Reminder, guys. These broadcasts, 
Very hard to run, very expensive. A lot actually goes into it behind the scenes, uh, more than I think is ever made public here. So if you've got a Prime sub, which doesn't cost you anything, definitely recommend dropping it, especially considering we're at the beginning of a tournament that's going to last a month. We've got several more weeks of fun ahead of us on the weekends. But let's resolve this fun. Match point for Kiljardi. An interesting pick. Order the Dragon up against English. That I would say is almost borderline S tier on Coastal Cliffs. Let's see if Cat can force a game five of Kiljardi is about to get creative. And let's see how the mental lines up after that very demoralizing game in game number three for Cat. Kiljardi definitely feels like he's the one carrying in the momentum into this game. But he's also picking a civilization that's very much out of the box for this map. It's going to be very interesting to see how he approaches this game with the Order of the Dragon. Yeah, like first things first, any proxy racks, I'm not expecting it, but like maybe just to be safe. It looks like his Hornet was weird, so we're not going to get any weird plays. I wouldn't expect it. Spearman up against English is just a death sentence. Like even as strong as they are, it's short bows. But what I am looking towards is probably mine work and mass men arms. That's very strong here. That's a very interesting build, especially considering the Lombos are mobile and your own men at arms will not fare very well. So, you know, Kiljardi, considering how aggressive he typically is as a player, and right now, Order the Dragon gameplay revolves around Feudal, like in terms of their best chance to win. I think we possibly could end up with truly our quickest game here. No Spearman so far here from Kiljardi. No, th obviously this one of the be. first things we're looking at here with the order and it looks like this is just gonna be an ordinary feudal age here for him like if you if you turn if you open spim in here you're just feeding like i i'd shake my head and just wonder what you're doing it's just it's literally the worst sieve in the game to build spearman against you could do like a cheesy like outpost rush but once again worst sieve to do this to in the game right like if cat scouts you walking across with a slow moving spear or a slow moving villager he's just gonna pull his villagers and kill you so yeah it, you just have to aim for the, the feudal. Um, the question is whether it is going to be that mine work. I would be shocked if it isn't. I think Golden Kuras is legitimately just too good to pass up. And the Arkham Chapel just doesn't feel substantial enough. In fact, they, in my eyes, they made mine work even better when they buffed the base gathering rate of Gilded Villages from 25 to 28%. It's going to be the Mindwork Palace coming in here for Kiljardi. Only two villagers on the building, though, and that tells you a lot of things, actually. It means that Kiljardi wants to bank up a bunch of resources when he, or by the time he hits Feudal Age. And that's something that I feel like he's going to spend on Gilded Horsemen. A unit that's going to be devastating against these early longbows. And it's also a unit that mimics the behavior of early game knights. Something that you can use to great effect when it comes to raiding. Well, like, one interesting thing you're seeing here is actually Kiljardi's teching up a lot quicker. The deceptive thing that's really kind of wild about Order Dragon is that, like, those two villagers, it compares to the free from 3D Cat. Because you got to remember, they have a 20% build speed buff, and, dude, I love this. Boar, it's a bit of a coin flip, but one player tends to get it spawned close to the secondary tree line. What a great read here. Kiljardi is going to probably start to set up an outpost, but with the way this is now protected by the wood line, Longbows can't penetrate it. I love it. I just love it. It gives you so many things. It gives you kind of an early warning against any kind of aggression. It gives you a strong point with a tower. And of course, needless to say, is the fact that it gives you a massive source of extra food. I also think, like, legitimately looking at this spawn, I really like it for Kiljardi. He got a retracted wood line. He got another one forward on the south side. Like, pretty much you can just wall that south side off or outpost and it's protected. Um, also, the golds between the two wood lines. So, like, now with that ball play, you just have a natural defense scheme against Lombo spam. And if they wrap around the east and north side, there's, there's nothing there, right? It's just berries and then open barren wasteland. So, like, later in the game, it's kind of uncomfortable. But the important part against English is that you survive the first 10 minutes. That's a big sheep hole, though, for a cat. Probably not the most important thing ever, but I mean, there is certainly a level of silver lining, especially when you consider the previous game and its outcome. It's going to take away most of that sheep from his opponent, but he himself is going to be somewhat focused on farms already. He has dropped three of them. So he hits Feudal, and we are likely going to see some longbows coming over very soon. 
Uh, the question is how far, how deep, and what's the reaction going to be? This is surprising, actually. Kiljardi doesn't want to even try for that man arms player that's quite popular at the moment. Instead, he's going to be going for the Horsemen. Yeah. Horsemen are I love pretty it. good. Like, 15 base damage and the amount of health on these units. They're actually pretty good at killing Eco, as well as obviously winning fights. It's very reminiscent to a Feudal Age Knights. It's a little bit... Um... It's a little bit more fragile, especially when you consider the actual armor values. But you can play this very similarly to how you would play a knight's game with a sieve like French, for instance. It's it's interesting in that regard, right? Like, because it costs the same as a knight. And I could, like, you know, you could say... But it's quicker. Yeah, it's quicker. It wouldn't win a fight versus a knight. That's guaranteed. Like, his attack speed is worse. You know, his base damage is worse. His health is better, sure, but, like, arm is worse. But against the English, is insanely effective. Like, the, you also have to remember your opponent is building Lombos, which are premium archer units. So every one you find is just all that more valuable. I love the sneaky palings play by Gat. <laughs> but it's not going to work here. Nice touch. Yeah, multiple horsemen coming in. And one of the things that you get with these horsemen is an ability to chase down the enemy scout. Unlike knights, these guys can chase down the enemy enemy scout. Mm -hmm. Big problem here for Kiljardi is that they are still very expensive units. And once Cat starts bringing in a decent amount of spears, they will no longer be able to take fights. Yeah, but this is like the OP-ness of, of horsemen. Like, I still rate horsemen as like the ST unit. I was, I've stood by that a long time. I'll still stand by it because... Yes, you could argue spears counter them, spears much cheaper, blah, blah, blah. But the, the reality is, if you're just using horsemen to attack the enemy's like army, you're not playing horsemen right. Especially gilded horsemen. These are raiders, right? Oh, certainly. So, so like, if Cat comes to contest your eco, you can test his. The difference is that if you drop an outpost, you stop Cat's contest. If he drops an outpost, it doesn't stop yours, right? Like, it's a very powerful tool. And that's exactly how you need to use this kill. Jordi lost his scout in the meantime. You can see that at the top overlay, he's got zero of it. He actually queued up a new one to make up for that. He desperately needs that info because, of course, one of the best ways to use um, those Gilded Horsemen is when you have a scout guiding them towards their targets. Yeah, and that's the nice thing about having the stables. It sucks to lose the scout, but at least you actually don't have to sacrifice the villager which is a really big deal for Ordered Dragon to remain optimal. Love this follow-up. Gilded Archers are sick here. What he's doing right now is he's leveraging the breadth of the Mindwork Palace to guarantee that he gets value out of every text eventually. And that's a really big edge here because the English, their timings for Blacksmiths make or break them. Mindwork kind of breaks that matchup because it's 40% cheaper, 40% faster. And also remember that you're saving wood on building a blacksmith, right? It's your landmark. All those details make it a very powerful tool in the Order of the Dragon Arsenal. And another thing is these archers, not only are they like two archers and one, they have 5.5 tower range. They can close on English archers really quickly. So far, those horsemen weren't able to find much of a value, but they at least keep Cat confined into his base which is extremely important if you consider the fact that with the English, you want to capitalize on this early aggression. Cat invested into 11 longbows and 7 spears, but has found absolutely no value for them. But timing's everything, right? This rotation here doesn't kill any workers, but look at what it's done to the gold income. Cat just queued up his first blacksmith tech, and now he can't get his second. Meanwhile, Kiljardi already has steeled arrow and undermesh, four gilded archers, and now the horsemen are going to wrap around because Cat doesn't want to come home to defend. So what does Kiljardi say? Okay, that's a pincer maneuver. He's going to backstab him here, and I'm a bit worried that Cat's going to get wiped. Uh, that's dangerous. Boar's going to get abandoned here. No defensive tower for Kiljardi, but he does have a couple of archers and some gilded horsemen back at home, and uh, he, I think Kiljardi is still waiting to decide if he wants to take this fight. He's swooping in from the south with the horsemen as we speak, looking to intercept reinforcements, and, you know... When you send in those reinforcements, you have to make sure that the longbows are accompanied by spears. Otherwise, this is exactly what's going to happen. And the villagers do get intercepted, KP. They Dude. were meant to build a forward tower, but they will be denied. That's sick. He kills three of the longbows. He idles out the villagers. The outpost is not going up. Yeah, I love that little detail. I was worried because Kiljardi, that was really suboptimal at first. He sent four horsemen after one archer. Then he split it. 
He got better bang for buck, and you know, it seems small, but we are talking about a one base, one base, all in from both players. There's no cheeky tech up, there's no second TC coming. There's just relentless aggression. And the cool thing about what Killjoy is doing here, he exhausted the ball to enable this horseplay. He needs good gathering rate still. Cat just ran back home. Cat isn't looking in the right locations and he's not aggro playing, which means Kiljardi is playing pocket eco, which is one of the big edges the OOTD has compared to HRE. There is this principle in RTSs that if you invest into army and you do not use it, it's probably the worst thing that you can do. And that's exactly what we're seeing kind of from Cat right now. He's investing into a lot of army, but he simply wasn't given an opportunity to use it. At the same time, you could argue that Kill Jardy wasn't able to kill much either. But first of all, that army scales a lot better because of the high quality troops. And second, Kill Jardy was able to force some idle time and do some harassment on Light Cat. Yeah, I don't like this circling gold again. Like, this is the point where you should be, like, poking the wood line. But I think he's paranoid about the Rax's production point. And while this is happening, I believe Cat did pull villagers. He should be on his way for an outpost. Like, if he's going to break this, he needs it. And yeah, here it's coming. So that's going to give me the attack speed aura, but that's still slower than the the archers. Like, I call these Gilded Archers miniguns for a reason. Check their attack speed. They attack once every second. Like, compared to the Lombos that are just baby speed, right? 1.62. If you look at the Gilded Archers, oh, baby. <laughs> and Kiljari is going to have defensive fortifications soon. He's actually on stone. So he's going to start dropping arrow slits and potentially fortifications to those towers. And once you fortify a tower like that, good luck pushing through that with just spears and archers. Not to mention it's cheaper because you are getting that same perk the HRE Oh yeah, sir. Arrow slits on the way, but I feel like fortification is what's going to make this really strong um, as a defensive position for Kiljari. Ooh, saves the longbow just in time. Now, that's kind of important, right? Your backline should be sniped easily, so even 1 HP longbows are very valuable compared to 1 HP spears. But he goes in for the reinforcing longbows. Man, Kiljardi, it, it's just chipping away, right? It's not this big bump straight away. It's just a little tickle here, a little scratch there. Before you know it, you're bleeding out. Those horsemen have plus 15 bonus damage against light units like longbows. It takes a split second for two horsemen to kill a longbowman like that. And that just starts to build up a lot of efficiency here on Kiljardi's side. In general, there wasn't much of a value destroyed on either side so far, but Kiljardi has definitely been taking the better engagements. Pushing now. He does see that there's a commitment on that gold line, so this is probably his best time to take a fight. He's just trying to finesse this outpost. Well, I don't like his cat. He needs a ram. Like, just ram. Like, the, the, just siege engineering, get one ram here, because that outpost and that archer range are not protected by e-repairs. The tower is too far away as well. If he wants to aggress the enemy base, he needs to move out of the range of the network of castles. Oh, and now, look at that Spearman getting intercepted as well. And the bonus damage applies against the Spearman as well, folks. So if the Spearman isn't fighting back, the Horseman can pick it off very quickly. And Kat is not... Rea like, his reaction is to react, not to be proactive, right? Like, literally, this entire army oh, is Lord. being distracted by four Horsemen. Th that's the worst thing that can happen. He needs to attack with this army. And he needs to do so before those Gilded Archer numbers are rising to sufficient numbers. We're looking at 34 longbows against 21 Gilded Archers, and each of those Gilded Archers are approximately two archers worth. I feel like the window for Cat is closing because numbers are now looking really good for Kiljardi. Also, keep in mind Gilded Archers that have higher base damage, so there's men at arms. Like, I, I, I was kind of hoping it's a mistake. It's not. He's getting farm clusters. He wants to spam men at arms. Gilded Archers will shred that down. Um, the interesting thing about Gilded Archers compared to, like, Standard Archers is Standard Archers, if you start a step, then you get more attacks in. From what I can tell, Gilded Archers is genuinely an A-click brain unit. You just stand still and you Gatling Gun. It makes it so much easier to focus on other elements of the fight. And only nine horsemen right now for Kiljardi. He, he kind of stopped producing them and he's just now playing into a full Archer battle. But it really comes down to the fact that he is distracting his opponent with just a handful of uh, troops here. and. Cat isn't even keeping track of these horsemen with his scout. You see, he's, all of his troops are back at home now. When Kiljardi is not even close to his base, Kiljardi is sitting back at home, and I think at this point he's actually flirting with the idea of Castle Age. They both are, but if they both go Castle Age with these comps, Kiljardi wins because of scale armor. 24 archers with 5 range reduction up against Lombos is not a pretty picture. And the, the reality of what happens there is Cat has to come out to fight because it will be about relics then. It will be about regnants. 
You oh, yeah. can't let Order of the Ring, you can't let Kiljardi get five relics, aka 10 relics, 960 gold of passive income. And once you get to Castle Age, of course, you do have access to Gilded Lancers, which will be insanely effective as raiding units. Gilded Men at Arms could still be on the menu for Kiljardi. And of course, the Castle Age upgrades also come in big. Regnate is the landmark of choice for Kiljardi. Wow. On the opposing side, you probably expect the King's Palace. But uh, again, as you kind of touched on this, problem is, especially with that scout being gone, Cat doesn't want to be here. He needed to win this game like five minutes ago, I feel. He's blind right now, right? Like, he can't see a thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This game oh, wait, is starting to be very reminiscent of the previous one, where Cat might feel like, okay, there's still a reasonable chance for me, but the game is slipping out of his hands while he's confined into his base. Yeah, so, like, the, the crazy part is that he's beating him on the tech up. Like, I was expecting that to at least be quick of a cat. And uh, yeah, of course, it's five relics, right? So it'll be 800 gold. I'm still thinking in uh, Holy Island on Golden Heights terms. But like, how do you not get five here? Is what I'm thinking. Like, maybe Cat rushes a monastery and just takes them away that way. But you're going to have to guard them one by one. Meanwhile, while you're doing that, Kiljardi could just split up. I think Kiljardi wants a fight, though, right? Veteran yeah. is on the way. I want to see Scale Armor being primed alongside this. I think it's just a game breaker. Wolves and it's, it's, it's going to be the diversion again. Wait, wait, He's wait. He's going wait, to wait, push with wait, the horseman on the wait, right wait, side. Wait, no, no, no. Ooh. Okay. Oh, God. I, I always forget that. Some I swear sometimes it actually blows up the wall. Even though it's not going to delete it immediately, that is right now 16 horsemen, right? And Kiljordi is doing it again. He's just using this as a diversion to pull Cat's army, but he just wants the relics. <laughs> Cheeky kid. That was sick. Cat, he replaces the burning wall. He'll get the gate up. So. While this is happening, though, Gilded Archers are now moving out. Veterans, he's coming in. Cat has already got his. That's the benefit with the Council Hall. You get it a lot quicker, but, dude, you're not going to slap as hard here, man. Oh, the Spearman got detached from the Longbows. The Longbows are completely undefended. You, dude, Kelchardi wants this so badly, man. And it, the problem is, now that you've come out of your base, it's very difficult to just run away. He has got the attack speed aura, so he's going to turn for the fight now. I think Kelchardi just needs to slow this down, right? Like, hold your guns. Like, your advantage isn't diving into the base right now. Your advantage is a mid-map. Play away from the aura, and you can easily beat these Lombos. He's waiting for the tier 2 range defense as well. Veterancy now in for Cat's army, both for the Longbows and the Spearmen. On the other side, Veterancy there as well. Interesting choice from Kyojari. He's actually starting to mix in some... Wait! Wait for it! Nope. Oh! He has it! <laughs> Alright, now, now kill him! Kill the monk! <laughs> You've got a big goal ahead of you, buddy. We believe in you, though. Now nah, he's not going to be able to get that, but it's an injured monk now, so it's kind of a liability. And this is already Kiljardi. One relic bank, two more in the way. This is... This is bad. Uh, yeah, it's 2TC for the English, but the thing I always say is, like, also these numbers are deceptive at the top. Add 28% to Kiljardi's number. Cat doesn't have a yeah. lead. And now Kiljardi is on stone. Could be for a second town center, but it could also be for a keep. One thing is short. He is scaling this game very, very rapidly. And uh, I, I just want to touch on the Gilded Crossbowman, something that we've seen being used in one of the previous games. It takes about four arrows from Gilded Crossbows to kill a man at arms. So those men at arms can evaporate very quickly. Yeah, maybe a fifth one, right? Because you have armor cloud eventually, yeah. but it, it's still really bad for you. Uh, these Gilded Horsemen are dangerous right now. They hit for 90 damage. So anything gets touched, just going to die. And I think there's some villages there. Kiljardi, a little bit slow to react. He's going to chase across now. Just a little touch. Just a little tiny touch. Textiles is there from Cat, though. So we'll minimize any losses. Behind this, though, we are looking time. at... Yeah, it's not just that. There's a fourth relic now on the way home from Good Guardian. He got four. The efficiency is insane, by the way. 2,700 destroyed value against 440. Cat is struggling so badly against the mobility of this cavalry, and we're just seeing a textbook way of playing against the English. You just want to stretch out their attention and never let them move out of their base. Yeah, and he's switching off of Gilded Archers. Like, this is about to be mass crossbowmen and mangonels, which basically kills everything Cat has. This is a tough one. Um, there's Gilded Archers. I love the fact he's still probing. Horsemen are raiding in. Should be some idle time. Cat not reacting straight away here. So could end up losing some eco, villagers. We'll find our way through. I love that game, dude. I love Cat right now. I've been begging for this. I think I said it at the start of the day. This type of play, when you're edge map like this, it forces cavalry raids underneath the TC. That's such a smart detail. And the other detail is it's a clown door. That's right. We're all clown themed today. 
They raid you left side, you run right side. It just turns into a Benny Hills. Sick greed, that just saved him a bunch of villages. And now he's walling off the left side, something that he desperately needs. He has been wanting a fight for so, so long, but he was never given one. But he kept getting ran around by Phil and Charlie. Now with those walls up, Cat might finally get an opportunity to fight. I don't know if his army is going to be sufficient for that at this point, but Cat might be finally given an open field battle in the middle. The problem is he doesn't know about the mangoes yet, right? And the scout, if the scout gets sniped, he won't know before the fight. But that's the thing that is really scaring me right now. Um, where's the siege workshop in the base? I think it's oh, on it's the gonna north be a side. Dude. Oh, it's gonna be a pinch. From the trees? Yep. He's not gonna see it. Village is moving out right now. Mangoes, looming on the edge there. Looks like Kat is respecting this and backing away, but the Mangoes might still catch him off guard. Get some range. Ooh, okay, that was big. <laughs> Kat, he gets the info and gets away without a scratch. Yeah, he's waiting for this tower to complete. He desperately needs that attack aura. Credit for it's due. He has a substantial army over here, but there is a key being dropped by Kiljari, and the tower is going to get cancelled. Cat once again forced away, and he's playing this very, very cautiously, and rightfully so. He feels very much threatened by that massive army of Kiljardis. Yeah, and I think Kiljardi still doesn't have the scale armor, right? Which is a little bit surprising. I mean, it's definitely very cost efficient at this stage. Like, the, the interesting thing about scale armor for the Gilded Archers is that it's basically it's the price of your regular undermesh, but it's three times as effective. So, a little bit surprised with this many archers he hasn't dived into that still. Instead, he's going to be trying to dive in the base. I mean, his Manganel timing is huge. You can see Cat now trying to get the counter with Spring Lords, but he doesn't even have one yet. He can't stand, he can't fight. He has to give over some of the base. Inks Palace on the front line as well. Something that could be taken out here. Tower is gone. Berries as well. A lot of units garrisoned inside the King's Palace, but what's more alarming here, I feel, for Cat is that this base is full of narrow choke points. Choke points that those mangonels will love. This is classic English, isn't it? <laughs> like the fact that they are being dove in their own base by mangonels and they just have to keep running. Big mistake there. He hung around. I mean, dude, if that hits one more time, this is over. Like, Cat is on the very edge of death here. The problem is the horseman can easily Ooh. find the Springles. That's where you see the value of those gilded units. Just one split second Mango. is all you need to take out oh, big groups of units. And now Cat is just getting annihilated. Killer Jordy feels like there is blood in the what? water and he's diving deep. Dude, he's about to reach the farms. I mean, dude, this game, like, Cat is flowing 1400 food. He doesn't know what to build, what to do here. Mango is just blitzing through the farms now. Finally, one of them is going to be struck down by all the TC fire and the Spring Lord able to backstab here. But now the commitment in. Another Mango shot out, keeping the Longbows at bay. And behind this, we've got more Guild of Crossbowmen coming. So this is just wave number one. Kiljardi will lose this, yes. But think about what he's done here. The kills on the military, the kills on the eco, the idle time. Just putting him further and further ahead. And behind this, they believe he's been dropping keeps on those sacred sites. Oh, certainly. And he's gotten some really good hits on these uh, Longbows. Wait, what cat? What, what cat? Cat? No, no, no. <laughs> What? He's in range of the archers! Oh my oh. god. I thought he had one more fight in him, but I don't think he does. He's winded. He's dead. A lot of villagers getting killed over here. It's a cleanup, but as you pointed out, this was almost just a diversion at this point by Kiljardi. He fortified the sacred sites in the middle. He brought forward some production. And now he's switching into some Gilded Knights. Now, I'm not a big fan of his army count right now, KP. He actually took a big beating, but he also managed to hit Cat's eco very, very heavily. And you know what Cat doesn't have right now? Spearmen. So Gilded Knights can work magnificently well here. Yeah, and the Guild Crossbowmen solved this, this next transition to men arms. What I love is the confidence where Kildrady was literally building that key bridge with three villages. Because right now, Cat's entire army is distracted, right? He's not coming out for this. But this is just going to be two sacred sites locked in, and Kat, by the time he realizes what's happening here, by the time he comes out five minutes and sees that keep for the first time, how do you transition fast enough here? Like, Trebs is not going to be quick enough. You can't mass rams at this stage. That just feels a little bit silly. It's a tough game, man. I, I think, like, this is similar to the last game where we're kind of sitting here going, Kiljardi would have to unplug the PC and throw it out the window. Like, we are very close to that point again. And, yeah. yeah. Definitely. I don't think the advantage of Kiljardi is as big as it was in the previous game, but the setup is actually very, very similar. 
Cat is confined into his base with little to no vision or uh, information on his opponent. And by the time he's going to start coming out, it's going to be too late. Kyojari is now fortifying the sacred sites, not just with keeps, but also with walls. And it's going to be a Barkshire wow. Palace here for Cat. He's going into Imperial. He gets a lot of good buffs for those longbows with the Imperial Age. Flaming Arrows, Elite, Volley. But all of these decks take A, time to research. B, it's also going to be very expensive. And at the same time, the clock is ticking. We're down to seven minutes. And Kyojari might just play all in Castle Age here. Okay, so, like... I want to give him credit that this is a creative solution from a terrible position in that, like, that is now a double workshop to pump a Bombard, so he could break the keep, right? Like, he could. The problem is, like, Kiljadi's gathering a lot of stone, and he's going to buy time. Now, behind this, we need to do a farm check, because that's the most important thing right now. If Kiljadi's, like, 30 farms deep, he's fine here. He'll catch up. If he's not, then we have a problem, potentially. 13. Yeah. Food is about to be a really big issue for Kiljardi, and now because he's Imp versus Castle, he can't use Siege to ignore that issue. Yeah, it's, um, as I said, I don't think his lead is as big as it was in the previous game. Now, Stone Wars will help a little here, but Villagers will be denied by the Barkshire Palace. I think it, it has to start with the fact that you stonewall off the left-hand side and just say, okay, we need to focus everything on the right. I think he also wants to go into Imperial, and this is where I have to ask you the question, KP. Are we going to see an Alsbach Palace? I think so. Like, th this is your win condition now. I don't think you need to go later. Like, Alsbach Palace is kind of busted right now. If you have a critical component your opponent has to fight over, it's a bit dicey because he could just roll the dice and go left instead, but that means he's playing away from Berkshire. Like, Alsbach is kind of legit now, uh, especially since they fixed the influence bug. And it just gives you an extra keep here. The only risk is if there's a cannon coming out, but Cat's not building a Bombard. Building and a Treb. And that definitely feels like a missing piece. I actually wonder if Cat saw the keep. He saw the stone wall. And it's going to be a pass of Rabia. And, you know, some of you might be frowning on this and say, okay, why is a pass of Rabia? Asbach Palace could be so good to fortify this position. But the pass of Rabia comes at a discount. And Kiljari might be desperate to get into Imperial as quickly as possible. It's also like it gives him a backup plan, right? Like, True. no one, look, whenever you're all in on sacred sites, you kind of feel like you're taking a gamble and it's like something went wrong, right? Nothing went wrong in this game. He has four relics, he has a lot of map control. So, like, it, it, I get where he's coming from. It just makes sure that he's never going to be behind in late game. But the problem is you're playing English versus OOTD. Um, it's kind of delusional to just pretend that you aren't in some way going to be behind. Like, Order the Dragon right now, I've heard it from literally the best players in the game. They don't really know how you win in Imp Plus. It doesn't feel good. So now that we're here, and English is still a Civ that's very confident at this stage of the game, Giljardi is going to basically have to finesse this. There's still four minutes to go, and the Trevs are getting through the keep. Yeah, there is no emergency repairs on that keep. Four minutes to go, indeed. As you said, Kjaljardi isn't willing to all-in this, um, this sacred site ploy. He's leaving his options open with the boss of Shrabia. But I feel like he might be forfeiting this position a little too easily here. Just one villager is sent to repair, no e-repairs on that keep. And losing that keep would be very underwhelming for him so, so easily. Here come the Springholds, but no repair villagers on the horizon. He's gonna try to bench it. He's gonna force the fight. I mean, a guild of crossbow mass. He's doing this before he's got elite status right now. So, tech advice for Cat. And he has got mass lombos with the attack speed aura. I kill Jardy. Mangos need to hit that back line. Like, he's worried as if there's Springholds here, but there are not. And arms. Overwhelm with the knights. Good waltz coming in. Guild of crossbow gonna stand their ground. You know what? I actually think he might have done it. There's three minutes to go. The mangoes are unanswered, and Cat's yeah. gonna try to reboot Men at Arms. But now that Kiljardi knows, the oh, the traps got pulled. You kind of touched on this, KP. Kiljardi pulled back the mangoes because he was afraid of Springles. But so was Cat. He pulled back the traps, and that's why the castle is still standing. One villager is all that it took for Kiljardi to put out the flames because the traps were pulled back. Springholds, and uh, now it's only one trap, dude. What a sick read, Kiljardi, the patience there. He was hesitant with the mangoes, and I was worried he was giving over too much, but you know what? Safety first, sir, this was perfect. That castle oh was gonna thread him through. I, I, I'm baffled at the fact that Cat, you know, he doesn't have any springs of his own because he's feeling a little bit gold stuff. Yeah, no, no traps coming out. He had nothing here, right? Like, you no know, heavy would have been perfect. And 
frankly, if he just rolls the dice and says, okay, I'm gonna keep firing at that castle, he would have taken it out. Th these differences make the mile, KP. That was one villager that was repairing that keep. In fact, I don't think we have a lot of villagers repairing right now either. They just Wait. moved up to repair. March here, please. Like, <laughs> leave that landmark. Dive coming in by the men at arms. So get across, but getting traded out. There's now hand companies here. These trade really well. Mango's getting a wall of in. I mean, I think he's done it. I, I just don't yep. see how Cat gets a big enough army together. That's the desperation play right there. He's queuing up horsemen. Feudal he lost the trap. horsemen. Kiljardi managed to pick off the only trap that Cat had. And it's baffling how much Kiljardi was able to keep this castle alive with only a handful of repair villagers. This castle was supposed to fall. And if this castle falls, I think that Cat can decap the sacred site. It's crazy as well. Like, you know, I thought maybe he tried to wrap right side and use the walls of Kiljardi against him to block the spring shots, make it a bit easier. But no, I, it's, it's crazy as well. Like, you know, in a way, if those walls had gone up, Kiljardi would have griefed himself with the defense. But now with the CC up, it's undeniable. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if in desperation, Cat goes left. But the problem is there's walls up there as well. Like. It, can we nah. check the walls, by the way? I think he it's, did it's get too the much unique now. HRE he death, right? He doesn't have heavy siege. That's the problem, right? Okay, so, so yeah, he got the fire armor, which doesn't matter here. He didn't get the extra health, so theoretically you could breach a wall, but you've got a minute left, dude. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just uh, too little, too light. What an unfortunate one for Cap, man. I, I think, like, I, when getting this, I said that these players are, are very talented. I think I could see either one potentially take it. Cat shoots some signs of life, but... To me, this is like Kiljardi just proving his breadth as he gets deep into a series. Khan came out strong with an early swing, but ever since then, I think Kiljardi's just had a more balanced approach to how he executes these maps and how he gets particular Sith matchups. And now, with just 30 seconds to go, it's going to be the Desperation Dive into eight Manganels. Oh my god! <laughs> and no Heavy Siege. Nothing that can take that keep out. More than all as well. Well, lukewarm world, you like to call it. Mangoes are going to smash this all down, and they are going to smash Cat out. He will not make it through in the first qualifier. But don't worry, 3D fans. There's still hope. He can always try again tomorrow, but this, this one's all kill Jardy. 3-1 victory for the Finn. Convincing set. And really, as you kind of touched on this, Cat had a great start, but what he needs to find is how to rejuvenate himself when he loses momentum. Game number one, he had an insane momentum and he capitalized on it, but things started falling apart when he started losing momentum. Game number four, uh, game number three, game number four, when Kiljardi took the initiative and when Kiljardi was the one setting the tempo of the game, Cat just felt lost. He wasn't able to recover once he lost that momentum. Yeah, I, I think like genuinely, I was really impressed with Cat's performance in that first game. But since then, it's just been Kiljardi, recovery after recovery. Like, you know, the the thing that I think we're seeing here is Cat, although he plays in a decent number of these tournaments, I feel like Kiljardi came a bit more prepped for the way drafting's meant to go and how you execute deeper into a series. Just really sick performance by the Finn. You know, I, I said that he's one of my players to watch and <laughs> people are going to like, slow down KP. You know, no offense to Cat, but it's not, it's not a BC, it's not a Lucifron, but this was really impressive out of him. I mean, he's a very promising player. I said he just climbed to third on the ladder recently. I think he got bumped down to fourth by Dimu. But for me, the the rate of improvement out of him, I think he's just trailing in Louis Shadow to, to put it on like a scale there, right? Which is a really big statement. He's a very impressive player. And I think what I always love is that he's very relentless, like dog with a bone, right? He'll go all in. What we saw here today was a little bit different at times though, right? Where he'd actually take it a bit safer, a bit more calculated. And I think that's promising. Like one of the things that can be really rough is that if you're very predictable, you're very counterable. Right, we talk about Vortex as an all-in player, but even he has his downsides when that happens. Where, oh, I know it's what Vortex is going to do. He's going to be all-in against me. I'll try and tull, as an example. Sometimes it doesn't work out because that guy's a god. But that level of flexibility, I think, is what's going to take Kiljardi to the next level. And I'm excited to see what he can do in the Elite Classic main event.